You know it's this. Take a perk and talk it and see. Money swallowing like six. Did it perfect to the kid. Got a million on my head. I'm a bit better put on a rope. I just win. I don't want to get a million dollars. The devil that's it in a chip with a key. Hello and welcome back, fellow anime lovers, to Manga Muse. I am delighted to have you join us once again in the world of fanfiction and fantasy. This is the tenth part of What If Deku Finds Ben's Watch Ultimatrix. Special note, this fanfic is written in a masterpiece of the incredible muffin on fanfiction.net. Do check and support the author too. Now smash the like, share and subscribe button for more. Also press the bell icon so that you never miss such great parts. Thanks for the introduction. Now let's dive into the world. Siro didn't know how long he'd been standing still. He hadn't even known he'd stopped breathing until Ida grabbed his shoulder, though whether it was because he was concerned for Siro, or he was having trouble supporting himself, he didn't know. Even while taking a deep breath, Siro didn't take his eyes off the television. The news had been covering the hero's raid on the villains with all the gravitas it deserved. Multi-hero teams were rare, especially when they contained big names like Best Genus, Gang Orca and Endeavor all at once. In fact, Ciro couldn't remember any time in his life when so many of the top 10 were all on the same mission, and they were all trying to save Midoriya. If his friend's life wasn't at risk, Ciro knew Midoriya would have been geeking out over it all. At first, Ciro had been confident that the whole thing would be over in minutes. Most hero-related operations didn't take long to resolve, not counting the cleanup afterwards. His opinion had changed when the building the heroes had entered suddenly and violently exploded. He dimly heard some of his friends and classmates scream or burst into shocked tears. In his own shock, he had completely forgotten his anger towards Asui and barely reacted when she grabbed his hand. On the news, the reporter was just as stunned as her audience. It's impossible to tell if the explosion we just witnessed was an accident or the result of a quirk, but I can see several heroes on the ground. Most of them aren't moving, but wait. I see Endeavor getting up. Hopefully, he can resolve this before it gets any worse, though with the collateral damage, there are sure to be civilians hurt, and what's that? Like everyone else, Ciro's gaze was instinctively drawn to movement on the screen. His eyes went wide as he recognized the blood-stained figure. Izuku, it seems that our deal must continue at a later date. Until then, please assist the master and his successor. Very well. I expect the next stage of my payment when I'm done. Of course, Midoriya fell out of the mercury-like portal and onto his broken arm. He bit back a scream of agony as the League of Villains arrived around him. When his pain-blurred vision cleared, he saw that he was kneeling in a pile of rubble, barely illuminated by small fires and the stars above. His pain returned with full force when Shigaraki kicked him in his shattered ribs. I don't know what sensei sees in you, he snarled. You're just a dying kid that can't do anything with his watch destroyed. I'm dying. Midoriya weakly raised his head and noticed all the blood. I think, he's right. If I pass out now, I don't think I'll wake up again. Now, Tamura, I know I taught you better than that. Fear cut through Midoriya's pain as all for one floated down from the sky. He no longer sat in a wheelchair, and his head was covered by a black skull-shaped helmet. Hate your enemies if you want, but always respect them, even when they're beaten. Boy, Endeavor, covered in his own blood, staggered forward with a fireball in each hand. Run, still standing. How droll. All for one didn't even look at Endeavor as he pointed one palm at him. There was a massive blast of concussive force that sent the hero hurtling into a pile of debris. Now, Midoriya, I believe you and I still have a conversation to finish. If I'm going to die, at least I'll die bravely. Midoriya felt at peace with himself as he glared at All for One. I'm not telling you anything. All for one side. Such a shame. He paused, as if listening to something. Tamura, it seems that we have run out of time. Kill the boy if you wish. With pleasure, Shigaraki looked around at his conscious followers. Magni, Toga, twice, make it hurt. Midoriya felt something in his shoulder crack as Magni brought her oversized magnet down on him. Then there was a series of sharp pains as twice cut him across the leg with his razor-sharp measuring tape, and Toga stabbed him in the collarbone. I don't think I've ever seen someone as cute as you are now, Toga squealed as she stood over him with a bloody knife. Do you think I could make you even cuter before you die? Even if Midoriya had had the strength to answer, he wouldn't have had the chance. A red and blue blur crashed into the ground with enough force to make a deep crater. A fist punched out, creating a blast of air that sent the villains flying back. Shigaraki tried to rise, but his leg was burned by a pair of Nurishok beams, and he fell again. All Might had arrived, and he wasn't alone. Get away from him, Ben said, his voice terrifyingly devoid of emotion as he turned into NRG. All for one. In contrast, All Might was all fury as he glared at his nemesis. This time, you won't get away. 
Are you planning to kill me again, All Might? All for one left. Do you even have the strength this time? Rather than answer, All Might moved, in the blink of an eye. He was in All for One's face. To those watching the fight, they expected the villain to get crushed in a single blow. Instead, All for One calmly reached up and caught both fists, as if they were nothing. The Namu from the USJ attack had shock absorption. All for One said, It had been crafted to fight you. Did you think I wouldn't have added a similar power to my repertoire after our last battle? Shock absorption. All Might said, Not nullification. All I have to do is hit you with enough force. Oklahoma smash. There was a brief tornado as All Might grabbed All for One and spun around. Rather than toss the villain away, as he usually did, All Might hurled him straight down into the ground. Before All Might could follow through, a blast of air sent him flying upwards. Air cannon and spring-like limbs, All for One said as he climbed out of the hole and dusted himself off. It's difficult for me to move these days, so quirks like that have become quite important. Openly admitting that you're barely able to move. All Might grinned, but there was a fierce edge to it that people rarely saw. You're as arrogant as I remember. I'm arrogant. All for one left. I'm not the one who decided to shoulder the world's burdens, or decide to be the person everyone would look up to. What kind of hero willingly tries to be the one the world depends on? You're the last person to give lectures on what makes a hero. All Might dashed forward, arm outstretched. Detroit smash. This time, the punch slipped through All for One's guard and collided with his face, his helmet shattered, and he flipped backwards, but halted in midair as if he'd landed on solid ground. Airwalk, he commented idly, quite useful when facing an opponent who can send you flying. He tilted his head. Then again, I was expecting a much stronger blow. Are you holding back so that the boy can be saved? Quite noble of you. Then again, my successor is down there, so I can't afford to fight at my best, either. All Might was about to yell for Ben to hurry up. He saw Midoriya's cousin trapped in the jaws of what looked like a giant blue serpent. Oh, what now? Your young Midoriya's cousin, yes. Ben craned his neck to look up at All Might. That's me and you are very tall. Do you have to duck to get through doors? More often than not, All Might admitted. May I ask you a question? Ben looked back at his family, and All Might was still shocked that the man had brought his wife and children into a crisis, powers or no, and then nodded at him. Sure, but we're moving out in a few minutes. That's fine. All Might pointed at the watch on Ben's wrist. I understand that young Midoriya's quirk relies on his use of a watch like that one. Why do you and your daughter have that? First of all, I'm not telling you diddly about the needs of my daughter. Ben waited until All Might conceded that point before continuing. Second, I like watches. Third, Izuku and I have the same quirk. Just assume that I can do everything he can do, and more. That's impossible, All Might said. Young Midoriya said that you two aren't related. Ben grinned, but there was something in his smile that All Might didn't like. It felt like he was being lied to, but he couldn't say how. I made a discovery a while ago, Ben said. I don't have time to explain, but there's something I call a proto-quirk. It's a one in a billion thing. But instead of getting locked into one or two abilities, some people can do everything. Strength, speed, elemental powers you name it, we can do it. All Might wanted to say that that was impossible. But all for one existed. If someone could take as many quirks as he wanted, why couldn't someone exist who was already born with all those powers? What he was most skeptical about was Ben's claim that he and Midoriya had the exact same quirk. However, he had no time to call Ben out on it. Nezu said that the Tennysons were trustworthy, and All Might trusted Nezu. He would have to save his questions for after the battle. Can you really fight? He asked instead. Young Midoriya claimed you were a scientist. I happen to know several scientists who are really good at fighting, Ben said. And yes, I can. Actually, I've probably been doing this sort of thing for longer than you. Since All Might had never heard of anyone like Ben during his stay in America, he could only assume that Ben was a vigilante that was skilled at remaining under the radar. There was no more time to dwell on that, though, there was a student to save and a score to settle. About time you showed up, Shigaraki snapped. I was starting to think you'd gotten the better end of our deal, 9. On the other end of the blue serpent was a man wearing grey pants and a coat over lightweight purple and black armor. A mask covered the lower half of his face and purple cylinders emerged from his back. Only the top half of his face, including his long white hair, was visible. His eyes looked out apathetically over the people fighting. I'm here now, Nine said. I can cover your retreat, while all for one deals with all might. There was a blast of orange energy as Ben cut his way free of Nine's Hydra quirk, and he landed heavily. Okay, final warning, give up now, or you're going to get hurt. Nine's eyes glowed yellow as he looked at Ben. The only sign of surprise was a single step backwards. Your power is impressive. You might actually be able to stop me. 
If NRG had been capable of smiling, he would. Who said I was going to stop you? Nine heard a sonic boom and then saw something flying at him at incredible speeds. He held up one hand, and a series of yellow circles appeared, one in front of the other, each larger than the one before. The barrier formed an instant before Supergirl, flying at Mach 2, smashed her fist into it. The shock of the impact bowled over everyone within 20 feet, including Ben. Why does everyone keep knocking us over? Magni complained. Just as Ultra Girl collided with her at just under 30 miles an hour, it would have been much faster but she slowed down so that the impact wouldn't be lethal. We've got this covered, Dad, Ultra Girl said, not taking her eyes off the leak. It is a coup to Ultiman. Ben was about to do just that, but another air pressure blast sent him careening into what remained of all for one's base. Oh, for crying out loud, Ultra Girl put herself between the league and Midoriya, who was now unconscious. You want him, you're going to have to go through me. With pleasure, Shigaraki held his arms out and crouched. Beside him, Toga drew two more knives, Magni hefted her magnet, and twice readied his measuring tapes. With a groan, Dabai also regained his senses and joined his comrades, both arms coated in blue fire. Come on, you three, Ultra Girl muttered to herself, I heard you talking, get Izuku out of here. Lamillion wasn't ashamed to admit that he felt fear. Sir Nighteye had taught him long ago that the day he stopped feeling fear was the day he would get killed. Fear sharpened the instincts and drove adrenaline, which could be the edge in a fight. It was only when the fear couldn't be controlled was it a bad thing. Unfortunately, Lamillion was dangerously close to losing that control. The big three had been reserve members of Endeavor's team, only sent in for cleanup or if there was an emergency. Things had happened so quickly that no one was quite sure where they stood anymore first. The building had exploded. All for one himself had shown up and stomped the heroes into the dirt, and now well, now Lamillion had no idea what was going on. Nerio Sun Eater looked as bad as Lamillion felt, but at least he hadn't tried to run. What do we do? Nejire Chan pointed with a trembling hand. Th there's Izuku. We should get him. You saw what that guy did to Ben, Sun Eater argued. If we go near him, we'll get blasted, and we're not as durable as NRG. We Lamillion took a deep, shuddering breath. As he did so, he spotted his mentor as he arrived at the outskirts of the battle, along with several other heroes. Sir Nighteye saw him at almost the same moment, and simply nodded. We need to look for an opening, then we grab Izuku, and run. Sun Eater flinched as Supergirl punched away two more of Nine's Hydras, each impact made the area shudder. Okay, but what do we do? Lamillion thought about what he and his friends were capable of, a rough plan came to mind. And as all might hit all for one with a series of rapid fire punches, he explained. He didn't give them time to argue. Ultra Girl was holding off the league for now, but they were starting to get closer to Midoriya, who was looking worse every second. Just trust me, he said, putting as much conviction into his words as possible. I trust you, Sun Eater said immediately, echoed a half second later by Nejire Chan. Okay, on my mark. Lamillion readied himself, while Sun Eater sprouted talons and wings, and Nejire Chan hovered a few feet above them. Go. Spiraling energy fired around the battlefield. Nejire Chan was doing her best to distract the villains, not necessarily hurt them. The sudden bright light was enough to put a brief pause on the fighting. Sun Eater then grabbed Lamillion by the shoulders and carried him into the air, flying above Midoriya. It was at that moment that Lamillion realized that there was a glaring hole in his plan. I can't reach him. I'm too far up, and if we go lower, the villains will all attack us at once. Nejire can't grab him, she's trying to keep everyone away, and Tamaki is carrying me. What do I do? What do I do? For a split second, as Lamillion hesitated, he saw Shigaraki. He'd managed to get around Ultra Girl while she was distracted by Dabai's fire. He was only a few feet away from Midoriya, and he reached out. All it would take was that one hand. No, I can't let Shigaraki get him. I will save Izuku. Lamillion had been desperately, futilely, reaching down for Midoriya, despite being more than 20 feet away. Then, he felt a strange pulse in his arm. His glove and most of his sleeve exploded as dark tendrils, almost like living shadows, burst from his skin. They writhed and lashed about for a moment, and then shot down to grab Midoriya. At first, Lamillion thought they were about to stab him, but instead, they latched onto him like they were made of glue. Completely confused, but with no time to ponder just what was going on, Lamillion pushed one for all to 20% and heave. Midoriya flew up like a fish on a line, but then the mysterious power ended as abruptly as it had appeared, and the tendrils vanished. For a horrifying moment, it looked like Midoriya was going to plummet back down, but then Nejire Chan swooped in and grabbed him before gravity took hold. 
I've got him. She shouted. Go, go. Lemillion dropped to the ground as soon as Sun Eater flew low enough and out of the battle, and took Midoriya from Nejire Chan. I'll get him to the hospital. Sun Eater nodded. We'll catch up, just run. This time, Lemillion pushed one for all as high as he safely could, normally. He would only go to 40% for short bursts, but Midoriya's life was at stake. If it meant saving his young friend, Lemillion would happily shred the muscles in his legs. Only once Midoriya was safe would he let himself think about that strange new quirk. Finally, he's gone. Ultra Girl cracked her knuckles. Now I don't have to worry about hurting him by accident. Please, don't tell me you've been holding back, Magni spat. You've barely held your own. Not my fault you're stupid, Ultra Girl said. Haven't you ever heard of feigning weakness? The insult caused a vein to pulse on Magna's forehead, and she aimed her magnet at the teenager. That's it. I'm going to kill you. A glowing aura surrounded Ultra Girl, and she started to get pulled towards Magni. She dug in her heels to slow the effect, but it didn't help much. Nice, isn't it? Magni gloated. My quirk can make a people magnetic. Depending on which end of my magnet I use, I can bring them closer or repel them. Ultra Girl made a face. Thanks for explaining how your power works. You really are dumb. She aimed a palm at Magni. You only make people magnetic, huh? How about I show you the real thing? Magna's weapon vibrated in her hands and was then violently ripped away. She was so shocked that her concentration ended, and without her magnet, she couldn't use her quirk to its fullest. Magni snarled as her weapon landed in Ultra Girl's hand. Give that back. Rather than answer, Ultra Girl raised the magnet in both hands and snapped it over her knee like it was plywood. She then carelessly tossed the pieces off to the side and smirked. What else you got? She's got multiple quirks. Dab I shouted as he launched a torrent of fire, only for it to fizzle out when jets of water shot from Ultra Girl's palms. You're just figuring this out now. Ultra Girl kicked a rock as easily as a kickball. It nearly clipped Toga's head, but instead hit one of her messy buns, setting half of her hair loose. In response, Toga threw a knife, as she'd expected. Ultra Girl reflexively blocked it with her arm. To Toga's shock, the blades shattered, rather than dig into yielding flesh. Ultra Girl reached out to knock Toga out with another punch, but twice pushed his comrade out of the way just in time. Instead, he was the one hit, and the sound of his arm breaking was heard by everyone. Oh, crap. Ultra Girl grimaced at the sight of bones sticking out of Twice's arm. Twice staggered back, staring at his arm with horror. No, 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 I can't get hurt. I'll disappear. I'll die. I'll wait. He poked his arm, and then his chest. I'm not disappearing. I'm not a clone. I'm real. Not sure I want to know. Ultra Girl muttered as she countered more of Dabai's flames, and outright ignored the recovered spinner until he tried stabbing her in the back. His blade shattered, and he paid for his attempt when she reverse kicked him 30 feet away. Everyone, get back. The sudden iron in Twice's voice was enough to make them obey. For the first time since any of the League had met him, Twice had cloned himself, and each clone was making even more copies. Within seconds, there were dozens of him, all charging at Ultra Girl. Sad Man's Parade Ultra Girl was buried under a pile of bodies, but a few clones were already getting punched back, turning into Grey Goop before they hit the ground. That's not gonna hold her back for long, Twice said, his voice full of pain as he clutched his arm. We should get out of here, Shigaraki. Shigaraki hesitated. He watched Supergirl dodge beams of purple energy from Nine's fingers, and all for one locked in place as he held All Might back. Part of him wanted to help his master, the man who had given him everything. However, All for One had always told him that he would one day take his place as the ruler of the shadows, and the prince could only become king when his predecessor was dethroned. At this point, with everything he was trying to build about to crumble, Shigaraki knew that trying to rescue all for one and save himself simply wasn't an option. Toga, wake up Kirajiri, he said through clenched teeth. Nine is distracting the flying one, and Sensei is fighting all might. He paused when he saw a full-sized human gausser smash his way out of the rubble and charge all for one. And that one. The rest of us just need to hold off the girl until Kirajiri can get us out of here. Toga nodded, barely aware of the blood trickling down her scalp. She hurried over to Kirajiri and started to shake him in an effort to wake him up. While she did that, the rest of the League still on their feet turned their attention to the rapidly shrinking pile of Twice clones. The pile bulged, and then burst apart as Ultra Girl, now standing 20 feet tall, shook the clones off her. Now, where were we? Ultra Girl glared down at the villains. Right, I was beating you guys like an old rug. Magni swallowed nervously. Hey, Toga, mind hurrying up a little? All Might bit back a curse as all for one punched him in his weak spot. He spat out blood and barely dodged the second blow that would have hit him in the throat. He was trying to create some space so that he could wind up a bigger strike, but for all his claims that he couldn't move quickly, 
All for one was doing a good job of staying in his face. It's a good thing I weakened him the last time, he thought. If only I had gotten hurt, I'd be dead by now. Fortunately for All Might, he wasn't fighting alone. Ben, as human Gausor, smashed his fist into All for One that sent him flying into what used to be a wall. Now you know how it feels, Ben growled, and then turned into heat blast as he glanced at All Might. Please tell me you know this guy's weakness. Does he have every transformation that young Midoriya has? All Might shook the thought away. If he had one, he took a quirk that nullified it. He's definitely weaker than the last time we fought, though, and that helmet looked like it was helping him breathe. Well, you broke that, so he's probably running on borrowed time. Ben ducked under a beam of purple energy that nearly took his head off. Supergirl, that guy's still bothering you. Only because I'm not trying to kill him. Supergirl flew between Ben and All Might, firing bursts of heat vision behind her. But Nine already had his barriers up. That's starting to get annoying. Supergirl pulled up at a sharp angle, then flew straight down, tunneling through the ground almost as effortlessly as Armadrillo. She emerged just behind Nine, who used his hydras again. Supergirl was ready for them this time, and froze them in place with her ice breath. She slipped through his guard and punched him in the face, sending him hurtling through the air. He landed in a heap next to the other villains. I'm going to help Jen, she said as she flew off. You two quit playing around. Ben laughed, but there was little humor in it. People were injured, including Midoriya. All he wanted was to put the bad guys down and help anyone who needed it, particularly Midoriya. Time to take the kid gloves off, he muttered, and transformed again. This time, he looked like a large, white-armored robot, with green highlights that glowed with energy. Atomics. Now that's new. All Might called as he rushed past, one arm cocked back as he neared All for One. Texas smash. Despite how battered he looked, All for One smiled. Replace. Instead of all for one, suddenly Ben was in front of All Might, and he took the full force of the punch. Atomics flew back at the speed of an artillery shell, and the destruction he caused when he collided with what was left of all for one's base was impressive. What did you do? All Might demanded. All for one, now standing where Atomics had been, laughed. Oh, that. I was saving that one for a special occasion. It lets me swap locations with someone else within 50 meters, sadly. It can only be used once every 12 hours. Okay, that's getting on my nerves. Atomics blasted apart the rubble with an emerald explosion. Does everyone explain their powers, or is this guy just being really polite? There's nothing wrong with being polite, all for one chided. You kidnapped a kid, and your flunkies tried to kill him. Atomics held up one hand, and a ball of green energy gathered. You don't get to talk about being polite. All for one fired another air pressure blast. But Atomics launched his own attack. The energy cut through the air like it was a soft breeze and collided with All for One. When the light from the explosion faded, All for One was still standing, but his suit was reduced to rags, and burns covered most of his exposed skin. Huh. Atomics floated over to All Might. I hit him with about 15% of what I can do. Not a lot of people can stand after that. He's got more powers than anyone I've ever met, except maybe you and young Midoriya, All Might said darkly. I wouldn't be surprised if he had a quirk that reduced damage somehow. Got it. We hit him harder, and we keep hitting him until he doesn't get back up. Atomics's eyes glowed brighter. If I get him in the air, can you put him down? All Might clenched his fists as he took stock of himself. He was hurt, especially after taking that hit to his old injury. But he figured he still had at least 45 minutes left in his muscle form. I've got more than enough left to hit him with my best shot, especially if Ben, what? Without turning away from his opponents, all for one had aimed one hand to his left. Black and red tendrils grew from his fingers and lanced out, where they struck the unconscious Kirajiri. He jerked like a puppet, and then a warp gate appeared behind the League of Villains. Tamura, all for one said, his weary voice full of pain. Take your comrades and go. Now is your time, go and fulfill your goals. I will, master. With a gesture, Shigaraki had several of Twice's clones carry the unconscious members of the League through the portal, while the rest kept Ultra Girl and Super Girl occupied. And I will avenge you. Shigaraki and Dabai were the last through the portal, the latter shooting out huge waves of fire to cover their escape. Both Supergirl and Ultra Girl were frustrated that the villains got away, but there were still over a hundred clones trying to scatter, and they were still replicating. If they made it into the city, there would be little to stop them before someone died. Fortunately, before they got too far, they ran into a wall of green energy, behind which stood an exhausted Ultiman. Do you know how many people? I had to teleport to safety. He glared wearily at the clones. I am just about done with this place. Thanks for holding him there. Ultra Girl crossed her arms in an X shape, while Supergirl's eyes glowed red. A moment later, a huge blast of green energy fired from where Ultra Girl's arms met. 
just as Supergirl used her heat vision. With the wall of mana holding the clones together, they couldn't replicate fast enough to avoid getting vaporized. Fascinating. All for one grin. So many interesting quirks today. In my younger days, I would have done anything to have taken them. You won't take anything from anyone ever again. All Might shouted, Oh, but I already have. All for one threw back his head and laughed. You have no idea, All Might. The last legacy of your dear master just fled this place as my successor. All Might froze. What are you talking about? Shigaraki Tamura is the grandson of Shimura Nana. That simple statement, said as easily as one would describe the weather, shattered something deep within All Might. All for one was many things. But he wasn't a liar, especially when the truth was so much more devastating. Even though All Might wanted to deny it, a small part of him, perhaps the part of his predecessor that lived within one for all, knew it was true. Tennyson-san, he said quietly, through gritted teeth. Yeah, don't hold back. With pleasure, both heroes moved as one. Atomix's fist connected solidly with All for One's chin, sending him rocketing into the air. All Might spun around halfway through his own charge and aimed his fist at the ground. New Hampshire smash. Using his own blast of air, All Might flew even faster than his nemesis, until he overtook him. He then spun around and stopped All for One's own ascent with one hand, while the other drew back. So much power was gathered in that one fist that it almost seemed to glow. You're done, All for One. This time, you really have lost. United. States. Of smash. The shockwave from All Might's punch was devastating. Any building within a mile that had somehow still retained their windows until now lost them, and more than a few structures that had been destabilized collapsed. All for one was clearly broken as he rocketing back down to earth, but Ben wasn't done with him. With one hand glowing with green energy, he swung up at a man coming down far faster than terminal velocity. The resulting wave of energy turned most of the rubble to dust, and Supergirl had to brace herself in front of her daughter to make sure neither of them went flying. When the dust settled, All for One was barely breathing in a hole ten feet deep, every bone in his body was broken, and steam wafted from his skin after the burns he'd received. Frankly, it was a miracle that he wasn't dead. Well, that happened, Ben said as he turned back to normal. I haven't had to go atomics in years. I mean, I probably didn't need to, but this guy was really annoying me. He glanced at All Might, who was staring down at the villain. Let me guess Archenemy. Killed someone important to you. All Might visibly started. How did you know? I've been there, dude. Ben sighed. Believe me, I know how that feels. How should I feel now that it's over? Ben laughed softly. Try to live your life without him hanging over you. Hey, dad. Ultra girl, now her normal size, jogged over. I know you're having a moment or whatever, but we should really check on Izuku. Actually, we should do that right now. Ultiman cut in, his tone urgent. I'm looking at him, and he's not doing well. At that, All Might finally tore his gaze away from all for one. But he barely took a few steps before he coughed up blood and fell to one knee. Are you okay? Ben asked. He tried to get All Might on his feet again. But the bigger man was several hundred pounds beyond what Ben was capable of lifting. And All Might violently coughed again and wiped the blood off his mouth. I'll be alright. I just overdid it a little. You overdid it a lot, you idiot. Gran Torino shouted as he and Sir Night Eye climbed down the walls of the crater to join them. Night Eye struggled to prop All Might up, but he managed to get him in a sitting position before turning to Ben. Go check on Midoriya Sam. We'll handle things here. Ben nodded and then turned to his family. Okay, let's get going. Tonight's not over yet. Sun Eater was in the very strange position of being the most composed person in the room. Nejire Chan kept switching between sobbing uncontrollably and nervously playing with Sun Eater's cloak. Lemillion was pacing, hands clasped behind his back, strange red lines had pulsed over his arm, the one that had created those black tendrils, but they had faded after a few minutes. The reason for their anxiety lay within the emergency room in front of them. Midoriya had gotten worse by the second, and by the time Lemillion had thrust him into the waiting arms of the doctors, he was barely breathing. In retrospect, Sun Eater would find it funny that, because he was the only one actually keeping watch, he didn't react when the Tennyson family burst in, only about ten minutes after the big three had brought Midoriya to the hospital. There were no words exchanged. The Tennysons brushed past the students and stormed the oar. Lemillion heard muffled voices of protest, probably the doctors, which were abruptly silenced. The big three shared a glance and then cautiously followed. They found several doctors and nurses frozen in place, surrounded by a green halo of energy. Supergirl gently moved them out of the way, while the rest of her family was examining Midoriya. This is bad, Ultiman said grimly. The physical injuries are serious, but I have no idea what's going on with his DNA. 
Can you heal him? Ben asked. Not when I don't know what's going on. Ultiman admitted. The Ultimatrix really messed him up when it was destroyed. There's only one person who would really know what's wrong with him. Ultra Girl added. You know I'm right, Dad. Ben sighed. Yeah, I know. Ken, can you put the paws on him? Buy us some time. Ultiman already looked dead on his feet. But he nodded and held a hand over Midoriya. His hand glowed green, and the same halo around the doctors now surrounded Midoriya. I froze him in time, Ultiman explained tiredly. Technically, I shouldn't do that, but it's more of a gray area. It just takes a lot of energy. You can take a nap when we get home. Ultra Girl snapped, then turned to the big three. We need to take him with us. We'll come back for his mom as soon as we can. Just give Mickey Mouse a heads up, will you? It took Lamillion a moment to realize she was talking about Nezu. He hesitated. But when he saw the broken and bloodied form of Midoriya, he knew he really didn't have a choice. I'll take care of it, he promised. Thanks. Ultiman snapped his fingers, and a portal appeared. I'll keep you guys updated oh, and I need to bring Brainiac back to give Yuraraka her new arm. Ultiman continued to mumble tiredly as Ultra Girl pushed him through the portal. Rather than push the gurney Midoriya was on, Supergirl ripped the top of it off and carried the boy. Only Ben stayed behind for a moment. Thanks, he said, for saving him. Lamillion smiled. Just bring him back, and we'll call it even. Deal. Ben smiled back and stepped into the portal. Though the big three had no reason not to trust the visitors, they also couldn't help but fear that they would never see Midoriya again. Nezu tended to avoid coffee. He was already an energetic creature and caffeine could send him into a hyperactive frenzy. However, as he sat down at the table with his ad hoc counsel, he wished he had some espresso on hand. After everything that had happened over the last few hours, even he was starting to feel the strain. On one side was Endeavor, now healed, thanks to Ultiman, representing pro heroes. Technically, it should have been All Might, but he had reached his time limit for the night. Then again, even if he had been ready for this meeting, he would have agreed that Endeavor was simply a better choice for such a grim topic. On his other side was Aizawa, who represented Yue. Nezu couldn't be that voice since he was the one being interrogated. Normally, Nezu could rely on Aizawa to support his decisions, but the information the man had had quickly enraged him. If anything, they were all going to be in the unique position of Endeavor being the voice of reason between the two. The third member of this informal inquiry was a tired man with messy blonde hair. His name was Mira Yokimaru, and he represented the Hero Public Safety Commission. It was by the grace of the HPSC that schools like UA remained open, and that heroes had their licenses. Though they tended to be lax when it came to Nezu mostly because he found loopholes in their rules more easily than he found lint in his pocket, he couldn't rely on them to take it easy on him tonight. Aizawa was the first to speak. Where is he? You'll have to be more specific. Shota, I don't know everyone who identifies as male, Nezu said smoothly. Aizawa slammed his palm on the table. Mira jumped at the uncharacteristic outburst, but Endeavor merely grunted. Don't play games with me, Nezu. Where the hell did those vigilantes take my student? I can't be sure, Nezu half lied. From what the witnesses told me, Midoriya San's quirk had been damaged and was preventing Ultiman from healing him. I can only assume that they took him to a specialist that Midoriya San mentioned that they knew. They have assured me that they will keep us informed. I don't care what they told you, Aizawa growled. They kidnapped my student from a hospital. This is a serious matter, Principal, Mira said mildly. There is already public outcry over the boy being taken by villains. If word gets out that he was kidnapped by foreigners, we'll be lucky if we still have our jobs. We're lucky that only heroes and a few members of the police even knew that the Tennysons were here, Endeavor added. Most civilians are wary of anyone with multiple quirks, and this all for one is going to tarnish that image further, if it came to light that there was an entire family of people that's strong. That was another thing Nezu was thankful for. While his family had had the fighting well in hand, Ultiman had used his powers to teleport any potential witnesses out of the area. The most anyone could report was a strange flash of green light before appearing several miles away. That had particularly annoyed the various news crews who had been eager to show footage of All Might fighting a powerful villain. As far as anyone outside of a select few were aware, All Might had defeated All for One, though he had suffered some injuries and was being checked at an undisclosed location. There had also been a brief press release that claimed that an unnamed underground hero had been the one to teleport everyone to safety so that All Might could fight without worry. It had helped suppress the panic, but the pile of lies and half-truths had grown rapidly and was one of the reasons why the meeting with Nezu was happening. They needed to create a story for all parties involved, and though Nezu had lost some trust with them, it was agreed that he was the best person for the job. Nezu was already making notes in his head, stringing together a narrative that made sense to the public, 
and was easy enough for everyone who knew the truth to remember. As for Midoriya-san, he said, I'm afraid that we have to trust that the Tennysons know what they're doing. His quirk is an anomaly by any and every use of the word, and his cousin knows it better than anyone here. Why should we trust them? Nira's question wasn't accusatory, but simply curious. They helped in the battle against all for one. But what else have they done to earn your trust? When they first arrived, Ultiman healed every one of the students, Nezu said frankly. When he found out that Yuraraka-san had lost an arm, which he couldn't heal, he immediately called an associate to provide a prosthetic that will replicate her quirk, allowing her to continue on in the hero course. For a hefty sum, I assume, Endeavor said bitterly. Quite the opposite, Nezu replied. In fact, when Yuraraka-san's parents mentioned that they couldn't financially compensate something like that, both Ultiman and his associate were almost offended that it had even been considered. They simply wanted to do the right thing. In fact, the only thing they wanted was to make sure that no one knew who they were. The act of generosity stunned Endeavor, though Mira smiled. Aizawa just sighed in relief at the reminder that his student would no longer be crippled. That is good news, Mira said, but then his expression turned grim. However, I have to ask just how much of Midoriya-san's background did you already know? Considering that I forged most of his file, just about everything, Nezu thought with amusement. Everything that was pertinent for a student. I knew that Ben Tennyson created the watch that stabilized and organized Midoriya-san's quirk, and I investigated his work thoroughly to ensure that there wasn't a security breach. What was your conclusion? Mira had obviously read Nezu's initial report. Now, he was fishing to see if Nezu would slip up under questioning. That Midoriya-san's cousin was a brilliant scientist, if a bit eccentric and a recluse. There was no evidence that he was a vigilante, and even if there was, it had no bearing on Midoriya-san. A word-for-word -word retelling of his report, Mira couldn't pin anything on him, even if he suspected him of lying. Very well, Mira sighed. We'll move on to discuss exactly how we'll explain everything to the public. However, the commission is going to be keeping a close eye on you and Midoriya-san for a while. If you think that's wise, Nezu said, knowing that they would never find anything on him if he didn't want them to. I do. Now, Endeavor, how do you want to go over your part of the raid? As Endeavor grumpily summarized how his team had lost to all for one, Nezu couldn't help but think about the loose ends still out there. The League of Villains and Midoriya, of course, but something was scratching at the back of his mind, insisting that there was something else. Whatever it was, he just hoped that it was something that could be dealt with. In the ruins of Kamino Ward, repair crews were already hard at work clearing away debris so that reconstruction could begin. However, it would be a long time before any of them discovered all for one secret lab but that didn't mean it didn't go unvisited. The power inside the lab was out, and pressure from the collapsed building above it was starting to cave in the walls and ceiling. However, there was still enough room for a single figure to appear in a flash of light. By all appearances, she was a young woman with short blonde hair wearing a white, silver-edged jumpsuit. Eunice, formerly known as the Unitrix, took one look around at the equipment and then at the defunct satellite. She detached a scanner from her belt and ran it over the center of the satellite, and was rewarded with a quiet beep. I've got it, she reported into the communicator on her wrist. Initial scans say that it's in one piece, but we'll need to do a full analysis at the lab. At least there's that bit of good news, asthma sighed on the other end of the line. Commence retrieval and begin the disassembly process. When I get back, I'll conduct the examination. How bad is the kid? Bad enough that Ben called me. Honestly, I wasn't expecting to talk to him for another few months. Eunice winced. Is he awake yet? I've already placed him in a medically induced coma. I need him as still as possible until I can get him stabilized. That told Eunice all she needed to know. If Midoriya wasn't halfway to recovery already, then it meant that his condition was serious. Call me if you need anything. She doubted that Asmuth would, but she had to offer. I may need you to run interference if the Tennysons panic but we haven't reached that point yet. Asmuth paused. But thank you anyway, Eunice. Eunice nearly stumbled and hit her head on the low ceiling. Not only had Asmuth thanked her, but for the first time in the decades of working for him, he had called her by name. Either Midoriya's condition worried him enough to make him slip up, or he was finally starting to change his ways. See you soon, boss, she said after a moment. Good luck. There was a flash of light, and then Eunice, the satellite, and all evidence of the alien technology ever being there vanished. Achako watched with no small amount of anxiety as Brainiac fitted a silver socket into where her shoulder used to be. He had numbed the area thoroughly, but watching the cybernetic port inserted into her flesh was unnerving, and she clutched her mother's hand with her own gloved one the entire time. Fortunately, it was over in minutes, even with the doctors anxiously questioning every move Brainiac made. 
He was even able to answer them so well that they were almost calm at the end. Finished, he announced, the connection to your nerves is stable, and awaiting the new limb. How long will that take? Iraraka's mother asked. Can you start now? Brainiac reached into the bag next to him. In order, not long, and yes. The new arm was a flawless silver. The joints and shoulder were spherical, but no one could see how they actually attached to the other pieces. The upper and lower parts of the arm looked very much like metal versions of the real thing, save for where they segmented to allow for movement. Hold still, Brainiac ordered, and set the shoulder into the socket in Uraraka's side. There was an audible click, and Brainiac leaned back. Done. Achako looked at the arm, hanging limply at her side, and then at Brainiac. I can't move it. Give it a second, it is calibrating. As if on cue, Achako felt a slight vibration through the arm. With more than a little trepidation, she tried to move just one finger. Her heart leapt when she saw her right forefinger twitch. A moment later, she slowly lifted her new hand, flexing her fingers and rotating her wrist. It works, she whispered. I can even feel with it. Tactile sensors, Brainiac explained. They feed your brain with the same input your skin would. It's actually based on my own outer shell. Achako tried and failed to stop the tears from falling. Th thank you. There are still several tests I would like to run, Brainiac reminded her. Firstly, please try to use your quirk on your pillow. Achako tried, but when she placed all five of her new fingertips against the pillow, nothing happened. The arm relies on mental commands, Brainiac said, his monotone slightly kinder now. Right? Achako bit her lip as she focused. Come on, activate. There was a slight tingle where the prosthetic met flesh, and then her arm changed. Pink circles of light appeared just over the metal surface of her fingers, like a digital version of her left hand. What she didn't immediately notice, however, was the symbol on her shoulder. It was the same as that on Brainiac's chest, though hers glowed a neon pink. This time, when she placed her hand on the pillow, it started to rise. Yukiko let out a muffled cry and hugged her daughter. Tenma, who had been watching anxiously on the far side of the room, practically tackled his family with a hug of his own. That was just step one, Brainiac said mildly. We still need to test the deactivation process. Sorry, you're right. Achako sniffed and wriggled free of her parents. I just need to do what I've always done, right? Affirmative. Achako brought her fingertips together. It could have been her imagination, but she thought she felt a strange tingle when flesh met metal. To her relief, her quirk cancelled out and the pillow dropped into her lap. However, that was when she noticed something off, which Brainiac noted on her face. Is something wrong? I don't think so. Achako frowned. When I use my quirk, I can feel a tiny bit of nausea, even if it's only for a second. It usually depends on how heavy the thing I'm using my quirk on is, and it gets bad if I use it on myself for longer than a few minutes. This time, I didn't feel anything at all. Brainiac nodded in understanding. That would be the arm. It is sending a signal through your nervous system to your brain to correct any imbalance in your equilibrium. You will still suffer fatigue if you use your quirk too often, but the nausea should no longer be an issue. Tenma fixed him with a dark glare. You messed with my baby girl's brain. Brainiac shrugged. Only the part that was making her sick. Before her father could do something he'd regret, Achako got up from her hospital bed and bowed. Thank you so much, Brainiac Sam. You're welcome. Brainiac reached back into his bag and pulled out a booklet. This contains all the features and proper cleaning methods for your limb. It possesses some self-repair functions, but I would advise against inflicting catastrophic damage. If that happens, tap the symbol on your shoulder three times, and I will return to replace it. You could also ask Midoriya Izuku to contact his cousins, and they will get in touch with me, if you cannot. At the mention of her boyfriend, Achako's good mood vanished. How is he? I have not been made aware of his current status, Brainiac admitted. All I know is that he is still alive. If there are updates, they will come from Ultiman or Ultra Girl. Thanks, Achako repeated and accepted the booklet. Brainiac nodded and then tapped one of the discs on his chest. A moment later, he vanished in a flash of green light. I suppose that's that, a doctor said uneasily. We just need to run a few more tests and then you'll be free to go. The Uraraka's hugged again, but the moment was cut short when Nezu spoke up for the first time since entering the room. I'm glad to hear that. But while you're running those tests, I would like to speak to the family regarding her future at UA. Wait, I thought I could still be part of the hero course. Achako protested. Nezu smiled kindly. Since you appear able to still use your quirk, I see no reason to expel you from heroics. No, I wanted to let you know that we'll be implementing school-wide changes. Nezu went on to explain that the League of Villains attack on the training camp had been an unforgivable breach in security. 
After discussing it with the HPSC, Nezu and the other teachers had agreed to move the students into dorms for their own safety. Visits to families would be taken in shifts, under police or even hero escort. The new program would last indefinitely, or until it was deemed safe for everyone to return home. I can assure you that what happened at the summer camp will never happen again, Nezu concluded. We have added security features only ever used in Tartarus prison. If someone who isn't a student or teacher even thinks about using a quirk within a hundred feet of the school, we will know about it. Personally, Achako was a little conflicted about that. On one hand, that kind of security meant that she could sleep soundly, without wondering if some villain was going to take another arm. On the other hand, there was a fine line between security and freedom. Nezu apparently read the conflict in her expression. Believe me, this was not a decision we came to lightly. With law enforcement and most heroes focused on bringing down the League, the hope is that these security measures will only be temporary. Achako's parents shared an uncertain look. Can we have some time to discuss it? Nezu-san. Tenma asked. Of course, the dorms will be ready in five more days, so you have until then to make a decision. After Nezu left, Yukiko hugged her daughter again. When we get home, let's talk. The other rising stars were similarly conflicted when they were informed about the dorms. Each had tough decisions to make over the next few days, and though they discussed it with their families, it was in each other that they knew exactly what they were going through. Book, my parents seem a little apprehensive, but I think the school's security measures are winning them over. Glasses, I am in the same situation. Tensei has also encouraged me to continue attending UA. Tape, my mom thinks it's a good idea because of all the safety, but my dad says we should just move out of the country. Book, is that a serious consideration? Tape, no, my dad freaks out all the time. We couldn't afford a place in a different country anyway. Snowflake, Endeavor says I'm going to the dorms. I don't really have a choice. Crayon, do you not want to go? Snowflake, I want to keep going to school, but if I do, I won't be able to see my brother, sister, or my mom. Book, we will be allowed to visit our families. Snowflake, not as much as I want. I just reconnected with my mom. Comet, can she video call? Crayon, Achako, Urbeck, how's her arm? Comet, made of metal now, still getting used to that. We can talk when I see you guys at school. Book, your parents agreed to let you go. I thought they would be against it. Comet, I told them that the villains might come after me again. Learning to be a hero will help keep me safe. Tape. That's pretty much the same argument my mom is using on my dad. See you at school, Achako. Crayon. My parents are talking about it. I told them I would walk to school if I had to. Shoto. What are you gonna do? Snowflake. Like Achako said, I can video call. I just have to get my sister or brother to bring in a tablet or something. My mom isn't allowed to have electronics in her room yet. Glasses, what about Sue? Has anyone heard from her? Book, no. Crayon, Snowflake, Comet, what did I miss? Tape, she threatened to call Aizawa when we said we were going to follow the cops and try to save Izuku. I haven't heard from her since we left the hospital. Comet, oh. Crayon, you still mad at her Hanta? Tape, I don't know. I still wish we could have helped Izuku, but a part of me knows she's right. Book, hopefully, we will see her at school and we can work things out. Book, Achako, have you heard anything about Izuku? Comet, no. If Ben or Ken or whoever shows up, I think they're going to tell Nezu-sensei before us. Crayon, that sucks, but in Sir Midori will be okay. Just gotta stay postive. Comet, thanks, Mina. I hope you're right. The first thing he noticed was how much pain he was in. Specifically, it was significantly less than he remembered. Second, he could hear someone talking, but it sounded far away or like it was underwater, though it was getting closer. And you hear me. He tried to answer, rather than words. An inhuman gurgle crawled its way out of his mouth. What? The voice sounded familiar, but his mind was fuzzy, and the connections just weren't getting made. He tried again. Ugh. One more time, but with words. He took a deep breath. Oh. Okay, that was a word. Good. Ben, Midoriya realized. That's Ben's voice. What's going on? Did he save me from the league after all? Where? Hold that thought, kid. Midoriya felt a hand gently pat his shoulder. Azmuth, he's waking up. Make sure he doesn't move. I haven't finished installing the third emitter. I'm sure you heard the grumpy alien, Izuku. But I need you to stay still for a few more minutes, Ben said, his voice kind, but strong. Okay, Midoriya said. His mouth felt like it was full of cotton. He thought he might have blacked out, because a few minutes only felt like a few seconds. He then heard a low hum, and then his pain receded. Can he move yet? Ben asked. First, see if he can open his eyes. Oh, I was wondering why I couldn't see anything. Midoriya's eyes slowly cracked open. As soon as they did, he almost had a panic attack. He was pretty sure the room he was in, not to mention everyone in it, wasn't supposed to be green. 
What's going on? He demanded, looking around. I think he's talking about the light, Jen said from the far side of what looked like a hospital room. She was wearing civilian clothes, but she was as green as everything else. It's the gene lamps that asthma set up. They're keeping you stable. Midoriya had no idea what a gene lamp did, but he guessed that they were the handful of what looked like spotlights that floated near the ceiling. Asmuth had to do some smart people stuff to keep you alive, and then Ken had to fix all your injuries. Ben gestured to his son, who was fast asleep on a chair. Poor kid's been hopping between three universes, trying to make sure everything's okay. He finally passed out an hour ago. Midoriya tried to sit up. It still feels like I'm injured. He took care of the big stuff, Ben admitted. You have to heal from the rest on your own. That's fine. I can just turn into swamp fire and Midoriya cut himself off mid-sentence. His eyes closed, and his right hand drifted to his left wrist. Oh, right. Ben nodded sympathetically. Yeah, the watch is gone. And so is the Ben I know, Midoriya thought, as tears fell. I'm so sorry. Hey, don't be. Ben pulled up a chair next to the bed and sat down. I'd rather lose that watch than you. Asmuth huffed irritably and jumped onto the bed. Save the sentiment until after you can leave this room without dying. Show me your left arm. Midoriya started at the harsh tone, but when he opened his eyes... He saw that Asmuth looked almost as sympathetic as Ben. He lifted his arm and then noticed just what was wrong. What happened to my arm? In the green light, it looked like a huge mass of black scar tissue covered his forearm. Jagged tendrils reached out over the top half, curling around and up. The longest part reached just past his bicep, while the other side ended in a few points, just below his knuckles. Ben sighed. I asked Asmuth, and he just gave me a bunch of science talk that I didn't understand. Maybe you'll have better luck. Asmuth ignored him. To put it as simply as I can, the Ultimatrix stored genetic samples of every species in its database. When it was damaged, those samples were forcibly merged into your own DNA. Of course, such a thing almost immediately began killing you. That doesn't make sense, Kara cut in. The Ultimatrix did the same thing to Ben for years, and there wasn't a problem. Because then, it was happening extremely slowly, Asmuth said sharply. This was explosive and unstable. Human DNA is robust, but not enough to handle over a million foreign genetic samples attacking it at once. If Ken hadn't frozen this boy in time, he would have been dead before I could even scan him. Midoriya paled when he heard just how close to death he'd come, though a small part of him was amused. As part of his cover story, he'd once said that his own transformations might kill him without the watch, and now, it was true. W what happens now? He asked. For the moment, you stay in this room, Asmuth ordered. The gene lamps will keep you alive until I finish a portable version. After that, we'll have another discussion. Midoriya nodded and leaned back in the bed, only to sit up straight a moment later. Wait, what happened? How did I get here? What about the League of Villains in All for One? The news said someone was hurt. Who was it? Is everyone okay? Ben shared a look with his family. Everyone's okay. Actually, you were in the worst shape out of everyone. I'll tell you the details after you get some rest. Midoriya wanted to know those details now, but his brief surge of adrenaline had already left, and he could barely stay awake. All he could manage was a slow nod, and then everything went dark. All Might sighed. How bad is it? Better than it could have been, worse than we'd like, Gran Torino said. People think you fought all for one alone, and that you beat him. But, Sir Knight I didn't even look up from his phone. But, people are scared that someone like All for One even exists. I'm not sure who leaked that he had multiple quirks, but the public is at least partially aware of what he is capable of. People with more than one quirk are extremely rare, most of the time. It's mistaken for quirks with more than one use, like the Todoroki boy. Regardless, fear of multi-quirk individuals is at an all-time high. Gran Torino scoffed. That kind of crap happens all the time. Some unknown thing shows up, does some damage and folks wet their pants for a few months. Most of those unknown things don't level half a ward, Knight I countered, and I doubt that All Might will be able to manage another fight like that. You're right. All Might held one clenched hand in front of his face, examining every detail of the skinny limb. I pushed myself too hard in that fight. I can hold my muscle form for maybe an hour, and even then, I'm nowhere near my full strength. Knight I sighed. What will you do now? Retire, I think. All Might shrugged. I'll make a public announcement, tell them my quirk is actually a transformation type, and that I can't use it long enough to reliably continue to be a hero. Really? Night I stared at his old friend. You're giving up. I would have thought you'd continue fighting until the end. Young Mirio will be graduating at the end of this year, and he's sure to make it into the high rankings at his first try. 
He's well on his way to being the new symbol of peace. All Might leaned back in his hospital bed and tried to ignore the pain lancing through what remained of his guts. Besides, there's something else I want to work on, while I have any strength left. Chigaraki, Gran Torino said, rather than guest. Exactly. All for one claimed that he was Nana's grandson, and I'm not surprised he'd use something like that to hurt me. You want to go after the League? Night Eye shook his head. In your condition, you might not be able to defeat them all, especially with Nine now affiliated with them. I don't plan on fighting Shigaraki, All Might corrected. Maybe, maybe I can reach him, save him. He's Nana's grandson, surely. Gran Torino stopped him with a stern whack from his cane. Don't even think about it, Toshinori. That boy is a lost cause, and there's no way in hell you're going anywhere near him. All Might was aghast. How can you say that? He is a criminal, one who's been linked to more than a few murders, and he's attempted others, including one of your students. Gran Torino sighed. This is what all for one wants. He knows that you'll lower your guard around that boy, and he's positive that he'll try to kill you. That bastard has plenty of talents, and knowing how people will react is one of them. If that is the case, it might be better for you to bow out gracefully, Night Eye reluctantly added. If you retire and fade away for a new light, it won't be as devastating as it would be if you were killed. All Might didn't realize tears were flowing down his face until they dropped onto his hands. I failed Nana. I can't fail her grandson. Gran Torino whacked him again, much gentler this time. You didn't fail Nana. Idiot, she sacrificed herself so that you could carry on in her place. And you succeeded. All for one is beaten and locked up forever. Just like every holder of one for all before you want it. As for Shigaraki, you can't save someone who doesn't want to be saved, Toshinori. I still want to help somehow, All Might protested. You can, even if you retire. Night Eye hesitated, then put a hand on his shoulder. You can focus on teaching the next generation of heroes, even if Mirio becomes the brightest light. We all know what can happen if the symbol of peace tries to do everything alone. All Might nodded slowly. I see your point. I'll give it some thought. On the subject of Mirio, Night Eye continued, have you spoken to him since the battle? No, why? Something happened when he rescued Midoriya, something unexpected. All Might gave him an inquisitive look, but his former sidekick wouldn't elaborate. Okay, I'll speak to him after the press conference. The next time Izuku woke up, everything was still green, but he was feeling better, with most of his injuries faded to a dull ache at worst. The pain flared up a little when his mother burst into the room to give him a bone-crushing hug. My baby, she wailed. I'm so glad you're awake. And mom, out of reflex, he returned Inko's hug. What are you doing here? Inko pulled back enough to give him a pointed look. You got hurt, Izuku. Where else would I be? All right, sorry. He paused. Um, where are we? No one told me. Ben told me we're on a space station called the Watchtower. Inko laughed, but Izuku could see the stress in her eyes. You know, I used to dream of going to space when I was a little girl but this isn't how I expected to get there. So, we're in Ben's universe, Izuku said as his brain sluggishly processed everything. When did you get here? About an hour after you did. Inko wiped away relieved tears. It took almost a day before they let me see you, though. Izuku nodded, but then a thought came to him. He dreaded voicing it, but he knew his mother had to hear it. Mom, about Ben. Inko tilted her head. He's right outside. No, no, the. Izuku tapped his left wrist, where the Ultimatrix used to be. The other Ben. He's, he's gone, mom. Inko stared at him for a long moment as she realized what he was talking about. Tears welled up again, and this time, they were tears of grief. Izuku soon joined her, and the two wept for someone only they considered family. Outside the infirmary, Supergirl turned to Asmuth. She had been listening in, and had relayed everything she'd heard. Is there anything you can do? Asmuth shook his head. If the Ultimatrix hadn't been destroyed, I might have been able to piece together the hologram's matrix, but it still would have been too corrupted. The best we could have hoped for was a hard reset, with no memories of what had happened before. Ben sighed. I kind of regret asking you to make him, Asmuth. And I regret that I didn't realize that it had become self-aware. If I had considered that a possibility, I would have used a more robust system. Why didn't you anyway? Ben asked. Asmuth looked down at his feet. I never thought a tutorial program would be needed beyond a certain point. A lot of mistakes from you lately, Ken commented. I'm aware, Asmuth said dryly, and I am trying to fix some of them. Speaking of fixing things, Ben said, how's progress on Izuku's cure? There isn't a cure, short of a celestial sapien providing assistance. Asmuth gave Ken a look, who shook his head. Then the best I can do is keep his condition from killing him. 
Anything more than that is something I have to discuss with him and his mother. Wait, are you actually going to ask his mom for permission? Ben stared at him. Since when do you care about that? Like I said, I am trying to fix some of my mistakes. A beep from a small device on Azmuth's hip made him pause. I will be back in a few hours. Hopefully, I'll have everything I need to let the boy actually leave that room. Azmuth, Supergirl, who had been the most hostile towards him, took a step in his direction. Thank you. There's no need for that. Maybe not, but I'm doing it anyway. For the first time in many weeks, Azmuth smiled. Japan had been stunned by all for one. Not since the rise of All Might had a villain caused so much devastation. An entire generation had been given a brief yet violent picture of how bad things used to be, though they were assuaged when, as always, All Might had emerged victorious. Any renewed sense of safety was quickly torn away when All Might announced his retirement and revealed his skinny form. He cited injuries sustained during the battle as the reason for why he couldn't use his power like he used to. As much as he wanted to continue his work as a hero, he said that it would have been irresponsible to do so. He went on to say that he was confident in Japan's future, with so many students from schools across the country that he claimed would outshine any heroes before them. Some people couldn't believe it. All Might had been an invincible pillar of society for decades, and for him to admit any sort of weakness shook them. Others refused to accept reality, claiming that the government was pressuring him to retire, or that the man in the interview wasn't actually All Might. There were protests aimed at the HPSC, All Might's agency, UA, and even a small group who blamed Midoriya for triggering the battle that led to All Might's retirement. Most of these ended after one or two days, though the internet would remain a hotbed for debate for months to come. Another announcement that followed All Might's retirement was the release of the identity of the League of Villains. Some, like Shigaraki, Kirijiri, Dabai and Nine, still concealed their true identities, but the police had worked tirelessly to unmask the others. Soon, all of Japan knew their names, their faces, and their quirks, prompting a nationwide manhunt. Hero vigilance was at an all-time high, and despite fears of a rise in crime following All Might's announcement, the first 48 hours actually saw a decrease in criminal activity. It could have been worse, Aizawa commented during a break in UAS Lounge. Our announcement of the dorm system barely got any attention. Even the attention we did get is mostly positive. Midnight idly swirled her coffee in its cup. People are seeing that we're taking the students' safety very seriously. And that's just over the security measures we made public, Aizawa added. What they don't know is that we'll have a dozen retired heroes as extra security. What happened to the underground heroes we had before? Snipe grumbled as he took apart his pistol and put it back together. They got pulled back to hunt down the league. Most of these old-timers have only been out of the game for a couple of years, so they still know what they're doing. Aizawa grunted, but didn't address that point further. How is construction coming along? Cementus and Power Loaders robots will have everything done by tomorrow morning, Ectoplasm said. As far as I'm aware, it's only a matter of moving in furniture, rugs, that sort of thing. I've seen what these dorms are going to look like when they're finished, Midnight complained. My first apartment didn't look that nice. You had to pay for your own apartment, Aizawa reminded her. We still need to arrange transportation for anything the students want to bring from home. Actually, that's already taken care of. Thirteen had just sat down to join the meeting, but now stood back up. All Might had his agency rent out moving trucks for us. We can have the students and all their personal effects moved in over a two-day period. Aizawa was surprised, until he remembered that All Might actually employed several hundred people, usually to take care of the minutiae of hero work, which freed him up to do the heavy lifting. I do feel bad for those guys, Midnight sighed. Some of them have worked for All Might for years, and their last job is to be a gopher. Plenty of other agencies will be happy to hire someone who worked for All Might, Aizawa said. Not that he really cared. Besides, employees of heroes who unexpectedly retired received generous compensation from the government. By the way, do we know how many students are actually gonna stay on with us? Present Mike had been unusually quiet until now. Normally, he was obnoxiously loud, but he could be quite thoughtful when the mood struck him. I saw a lot of general studies kids drop out. The business course took a hit too, Snipe added. I think we lost about 200 students, all told. None from the support course, 13 said. Some were considering it, but Shield San apparently sent them all a rousing email. If I didn't know that All Might wasn't around, I'd swear he wrote that speech for her. And what about the hero course? Midnight asked. Vlad King crossed his arms. I haven't heard back from all of my class yet, but the ones who did make a decision are staying on. 
What about you, Eraser? Aizawa closed his eyes. Almost all of mine have either said that they'll at least give the dorms a shot, or gave a definite yes. The only one who hasn't given me an answer is Midoriya. Vlad asked when Aizawa trailed off. What's his condition? Ultiman gave me a bit of news on that this morning. Aizawa pretended to ignore how eagerly the other teachers paid attention. He's awake and stable for the moment. However, he can't be moved yet, and he hasn't been made aware of all the details that happened during and after the attack on the camp. Present Mike flinched. He doesn't know about his girlfriend. When the other teachers shot him a look, he shrugged. What? Just cause they're not making out in my class doesn't mean I can't figure it out. I don't think he knows yet, Aizawa admitted. And his friends don't know about his condition either. I'm hoping that will change soon, because at least three of them email me for updates every few hours. Let's assume that he makes a full recovery, 13 said. Do you think he'll continue on as a student? The only other person who suffered as badly as him was Yuraraka san so I wouldn't blame him if he quit. Honestly I'm not sure. Neither Izuku nor Inko really talked about anything except Holoben until the next day. Their grief made trying to do anything feel like crawling through molasses. It wasn't until the next day, after a long time crying and nightmare-riddled sleep, that Inko brought up school. Izuku had been confused about the dorm system, until Ben and Ken brought him up to speed. So, yeah, the League of Villains got away, which has a lot of people on edge, Ken concluded. Security for your school is a big deal right now, and it was decided that it would be safer if all the students just lived on campus until the bad guys got put away. I guess I can understand that, Izuku said, but could I even stay a student at UA? Without the Ultimatrix, I'm back to being quirkless. Ken rolled his eyes. First of all, you don't need powers to be a hero. Remember, I told you my girlfriend doesn't have powers, and she's arguably the third scariest person on the planet. Izuku smiled weakly. Why yeah, but my Earth isn't as open-minded about who can be a hero. Well, let's pretend for a minute that you still have the watch, Ben said. Would you still want to stay in your school, or do you want to back out? After what happened to you, no one would blame you. Izuku took a moment to put aside the fact that the Ultimatrix was destroyed, and really thought about his future at UA. He still wanted to be a hero, to the point that he couldn't imagine doing anything else. However, the League of Villains had made a pretty good attempt at killing him, and there was every possibility that they would try again. Then there was the most important factor to consider. Mom, he looked Inko in the eye. What do you think? Inko stared down at her hands. Honestly, Izuku, part of me wants to take you far away from Japan, find the most remote location in the world, and hide you from those monsters. But I know that you would make yourself sick with worry over your friends and everyone else we'd leave behind. She reached out and gently cupped Izuku's face. Before I support this, I want you to promise me two things. First, I want you to never get this hurt again. Actually, I want you to do your best not to get hurt at all but death and crippling injuries are at the top of the list. Second, I want you to be honest with yourself, whatever you decide. I want you to walk that path without regret. Izuku absorbed all that for what seemed like an eternity. Finally, he nodded. I can do that, mom. Inko smiled through her tears. Okay, then. If you still want to be a hero, then you have my blessing. She hugged him. Oh, one more thing. When you're at the dorms, remember to call often. At least three times a week, and one text a day to tell me that you're alright. I can do that. Izuku sighed. But I still don't have the Ultimatrix. The door to the infirmary slid open. Though Izuku thought that no one was there, then he looked down, and saw Asmuth walk in, with something tucked under his arm. No, you don't have the Ultimatrix, Asmuth said, and hopped onto the bed. But that device was old and faulty. I'd planned on giving you a replacement after additional time observing you. Obviously, things have changed, and my hand has been forced. Ken rolled his eyes again. Oh my god, just give him the thing already. Asma scowled at him, then turned his glare to Izuku. Hold out your arm. Izuku did so. His left wrist was suddenly concealed by a black disc that bore a familiar hourglass symbol. As soon as it touched his skin, a thin band emerged and looped around, binding it to his arm. There was a quiet beep, and then the dial flashed several times. That's it, Inko asked. It almost looks like a regular watch. Asmuth ignored her, and started rotating the dial one way, then another. The primary function appears to be working. I'll be deactivating the gene lamps now, you don't need them. A few seconds later, the green light faded, and Izuku sighed in relief. Green was his favorite color, but he could only stand it for so long. With everything appearing normal again, he could finally get a good look at the scar on his arm. What he thought was black was actually a dark green, and wherever it covered his skin, there was a slight indent, as if the outermost layer of flesh had been carved away. Any increase in pain or fatigue, 
Azmuth asked. Izuku focused on his arm for a second. It's a little sore, I guess. I don't feel tired. The pain will fade in a few hours. The new Omnitrix is stabilizing your DNA and suppressing the damage from the foreign samples. Well, well. Ben held up a hand to stop him. Omnitrix, you finally got around to making a new Omnitrix. You have a perfected version of the Ultimatrix, Asmuth snapped. Why are you complaining? Because he's not getting the shiny new toy. Ken teased, then casually picked his father up by the shoulder. Let him explain, Dad. While Ben pouted, Asmuth continued. As I said, the primary function of the new Omnitrix is to keep you alive. The power requirements for such a task have necessitated several failsafe protocols. Like what? Izuku asked. Your transformation time is still limited to one hour, Asmuth said gravely. If you reach that limit, all other functions will be suspended while the Omnitrix focuses entirely on keeping you alive. During that time, you will suffer extreme fatigue, muscle pain, and some sensory loss, likely sight or hearing. This will last for at least 20 minutes, but could continue for several hours. That sounds pretty extreme, Ben said, all joking gone from his voice. You fail to realize just what happened to the boy, Asmuth snapped. He went through the genetic equivalent to the Big Bang, and only survived by the skin of his teeth. Oh, Ben sat down on a chair and shut his mouth. As I was saying, the failsafe shutdown will only happen if you stay transformed for a full hour. If you turn back to normal before then, the Omnitrix will require a 5-minute recharge. You shouldn't have any problems after that. Basically, don't let the battery completely die, or you'll need a soft reboot, Ken added helpfully. Izuku nodded. Why you said I can still transform, right? I don't see a button to turn the watch on. Asma stroked his tendrils. I was informed of how you were captured, and the inherent weakness of a manual change. The new Omnitrix will respond to your conscious thoughts, rather than manual selection. You're giving him master control, too. Ben huffed, but it was clear he wasn't actually upset. How come it took so long for me to get it? First, because the boy is more selfless than you were at that age, Asmuth replied. Second, none of your enemies figured out how to stop you from transforming. Third, who said I was giving him master control? His transformation time will always be limited because of his condition, and any new accessible alien DNA will have to be carefully unlocked or it could destabilize the entire process, and we'll be right back here. Ken decided to translate again. You can turn into any alien you've already got by thinking about it, but don't expect many new guys. Izuku looked down at the Ultimatrix. No, he had to remind himself that this was the Omnitrix. He thought about testing it out, and as soon as he did, the dial began to spin on its own, and with the sound of glass shards hitting the ground, a green sheath grew out from the watch, stretching to just below his knuckles, and up to just below his elbow. And it will do that when you're ready for action, Asmuth added, somewhat unnecessarily. It's an added stabilizing feature for your arm. Oh okay. Izuku focused on one alien, and in a flash of green light, he turned into four arms. Hey, it worked. Of course it worked, Asmuth grumbled. Hey, kid. Ben looked slightly apprehensive. You might want to turn back. Four arms is kinda, with only a brief groan of warning. The hospital bed crumpled under Izuku. Heavy. Izuku turned back to normal without touching the dial on his chest, and blushed. Uh, sorry. Don't worry, I'll fix it, Ken said. Still, that takes care of a test, right? Indeed, Asma said. Brainiac will need to run a few tests to be sure, but I imagine that he can go home later today. Your friends are worried sick, Ken told Izuku. They've been bugging your teacher to bug me every time I visit your Earth. You're gonna have some explaining to do, especially the arm and your eyes. Izuku blinked. My eyes. Ben facepalmed. We didn't tell him. Ken sighed. You might want to use the bathroom mirror. With some help from his mother, Izuku stiffly got up and walked to the bathroom. For a long moment, he stared at his own reflection, unable to comprehend what he was seeing. The whites of his eyes were gone, replaced by a dark green identical to the mark on his arm. His irises actually glowed a neon green, almost like green bolts of lightning trapped in glass. For some reason, the first thought that went through his head was that, between their messy hair and now his eyes, he and Ishido might be mistaken for being related. Well, he took a deep, shuddering breath. This is going to take some getting used to. If it helps, it's purely cosmetic, Asmuth said. Though you should inform me if you feel any pain in your arm or your eyes. He shrugged. Anyway, my task here is done. I have to return to my lab. There is some work I need to do. Asmuth Sam and Ko stood in front of him, blocking his path, and bowed low. Thank you for saving my son. After a moment's hesitation, Asmuth smiled. It was no problem. He then paused, as if remembering something. By the way, the new Omnitrix still has the ultimate function, 
but none of the aliens have been assigned a hyper-evolutionary slot. Then, you can go over his available aliens so that he can make his ten choices. Wait, what? Ben did a double take, but Azmuth was already gone. Even when he's sorry, he's still a jerk. Izuku didn't know what to say, he was still overwhelmed by everything that had happened. Thankfully, Ken helped him over to another bed with an understanding smile. I guess we have some stuff to go over before you go home, huh? Iraraka's return was so important to her class that entering the dorm was almost an afterthought. More than a few tears were shed as she hugged her friends, while her new arm was examined and complimented. So, it's just as good as the real thing, Siro asked as he lifted her arm up to shoulder level. Quirk and everything. Uraraka gently tugged her arm free. Yeah, and I can now punch people really, really hard. Absolutely fascinating, Ida said. I cannot wait to see how you use it. Of course, what we're happiest about is that you're back, Yeyurazu said pointedly. We were worried. Thanks, Momo. Uraraka spotted Asui near the back of the crowd, but before she could say anything, Asui turned away, shamefaced. Uraraka frowned, but Aizawa cut in. You can discuss everything else later. Right now, I want you all to get acquainted with the dorms. More than one student gaped at the interior. If Uraraka hadn't been over to Yeyurazu's house, she would have been overwhelmed. The dorms were nicer than her parents' house. It felt like she was in a fancy hotel, not part of her school. Everyone has an assigned room, Aizawa said. There's a shared kitchen, which will be fully stocked. If you have a particular request for food, you can submit it. You'll also have separate restrooms and laundry rooms. Wait, so the showers aren't shared. Mind to wind, only to have his mouth taped shut by Siro. Aizawa ignored the little pervert. We will have a curfew, but that only applies to being inside the dorms. It'll be up to you when you go to sleep, but making poor choices will affect your performance in class, so keep that in mind. He looked down at his phone. Your things from home will be here soon, so you'll be able to decorate your rooms as you see fit. He turned around. Anyway, that's it. I'm going to take a nap. Aizawa sensei. Uraraka held up her hand, as if they were in class. What about Izuku? Aizawa sighed. All I know is that he's recovering. Whether or not he comes back to UA is his decision. Among the majority of the class, the students looked worried. Even Bakugo scowled more than usual. It was worse for the rising stars, their reactions ranged from clenched fists to barely checked tears. Uraraka noticed that Asui was rubbing at her eyes, refusing to look at anyone. Part of her wanted to comfort her friend, but she thought that she should do that when the entire class wasn't present. Maybe seeing Deku Kun again will make her feel better, she thought. I just hope. I just hope he does come back. Achako. Uraraka turned to see Todoroki. He tried to look stoic, but she had known him long enough to see the distress in his eyes. I need to apologize. She blinked and tried to figure out what he was talking about. Oh, you mean what happened during the attack? Nezu Sensei told me about that. She smiled and gave him a quick hug. You saved my life, Shoto. Don't apologize for that. Ashido grinned and gave Todoroki a quick kiss on the cheek. Told you she'd be cool about it. You were right. Todoroki smiled at Uraraka, then at Ashido. Of course I'm right, I'm your girlfriend. We're official now. Ashido winked at him. If we're not, mine too will keep staring. Good point. Todoroki put an arm around her shoulders and ignored the whining coming from Minta's direction. Uraraka was happy for them. She really was, but it was a pointed reminder that her own boyfriend was still missing. Even when, not if, because she refused to give up hope, he came back, there were other concerns. Part of her was worried that her prosthetic would disgust him, and he would want nothing to do with her. She knew Midoriya better than that, but she couldn't help herself. For now, she focused on getting her room ready. She could worry about everything else when the time came. Welcome back, Midoriya-san. Nezu smiled widely at his student. It's good to see you up and about. Th thank you, Nezu-sensei. Midoriya bowed, glad that Nezu wasn't mentioning his eyes or arm. He was still getting used to it himself. I'm glad to be back. Nezu nodded at him, and then at his escort. Thank you for saving him. Then smiled. Hey, anytime. As long as Izuku doesn't make a habit of needing saving. Jen added as she ruffled Midoriya's hair. He tried to pull away. But she had super strength, and he didn't. Ken coughed to get Nezu's attention. Everything's okay over here, right? Nezu sighed. The villains are still out there, but things have been quiet since the Kamino incident. I think we can handle it. Just remember that we're only a phone call away, Ben said. If you need backup, I appreciate the offer, and I will certainly keep it in mind, Nezu interrupted. However, we need to be able to save ourselves, and we can't do that if we are always relying on outside help. Also, the more people from outside this universe arrive, the harder it will be to maintain Midoriya-san's cover story. Yeah, can't let my little cousin get in trouble, can I? 
Jen laughed and hugged Midoriya hard enough that he could feel his ribs move. Thankfully, Ken pried her arms open to allow Midoriya to escape. Anyway, we were just dropping him off. Don't forget your lunch. Jen teased, and Midoriya's head drooped. So we'll be going, Ken finished. Then laughed and gave Midoriya a one-armed hug. Remember what we said the first time you visited. If you need anything, even if you just want to talk, call us. Thanks, I will. Midoriya raised his arm to show the Omnitrix. Can you thank Asmuth again for me? I'll be sure to pass it along. Then stepped back. Come on, kids, we need to go home. Bye, cousin. Jen gave Midoriya another bone-crushing hug before joining her father. Try not to get kidnapped again while we're gone, Ken added. Midoriya rubbed his aching ribs. I'll do my best. It can be witty. Ben laughed for a moment, then looked at Nezu. Take good care of him, okay? Nezu bowed. To the best of my ability. That answer seemed to satisfy the Tennysons, because without another word, Ken snapped his fingers, and they were gone. I'm pleased that you decided to return to UA, Nezu said as he walked with Midoriya. I received an email from the principal of Shikesu High, wondering if you would transfer to his school if the idea of staying with UA was too traumatic. I'm happy to tell him that won't be necessary. He'll have to find his own star pupil. Midoriya blushed at the idea of two adults fighting over him like a rare collectible, and decided to change the subject. I H heard about Achako, Nezu Sensei. Nezu's smile vanished. Yes, more than one hero graduate of mine has been hurt in the line of duty, some fatally. But this is the first time a current student was so badly injured. I believe that we, the faculty and pro heroes alike, were overconfident with our security measures. From now on, we will be constantly improving, searching for any way for an enemy to get past, and correcting that error. That's a relief to hear, Midoriya said. Here's another, a familiar voice added. Classes don't start for another two days, so you haven't missed anything. Midoriya jumped when he saw his homeroom teacher, Aizawa Sensei. Izu, Iri was a blur as she tackled his legs. You're back. Midoriya immediately knelt to give the little girl a hug. Why yeah, I am. Iri looked up, and her watery eyes met his altered ones. You look different. I got hurt, but I'm okay now. Okay. Iri took a moment to wipe her eyes. Are you going to stay here too? Oh uh huh. Midoriya smiled. That means you can see me, Achako, and all our friends every day. Iri's eyes went even wider, as if she hadn't considered that. Yeah, Aizawa coughed into his fist to get their attention. Come on, I'll show you to the dorm. Midoriya held Iri's hand in one of his, and his suitcase in the other. He was so busy talking to Iri that he missed the amused glance Nezu shared with Aizawa. A few minutes later, the latter used his finely honed reflexes to quickly, but gently, pull Iri away. Midoriya barely had time to register that Iri was gone before he was tackled again. This time, it was by four people who were all taller than him. My flying buddy has returned. Hado shouted gleefully as she hugged him. Nejire, I think he's turning blue, Melissa said, futilely tugging at the other girl's arm to try and free Midoriya. Nah, that's purple. Togato laughed. He's blushing at the same time. Amajiki just mumbled. When Midoriya was finally freed and got his breath back, he wondered why Amajiki would be part of the group hug. Then he saw how Tagata had a firm grip on his friend's shoulder and realized that he'd probably been forced to participate. However, he felt a bit of fondness for Amajiki when he saw that he wasn't actually fighting to get free. Aizawa allowed the Big Three and Melissa access to Midoriya for a few minutes, then pointedly asked what they were doing, considering third-year classes had already started. Come on, Aizawa-sensei. Tagata protested, the last time we saw this guy. He was covered and he paused when he saw Iri watching intently. Or he didn't look too good. Yeah, we're just making sure my flying buddy is okay. Hato added with an unrepentant grin, and Melissa nodded behind her. Amajiki sighed when the teacher turned to hear his excuse. I was dragged here. Aizawa's own sigh was a perfect echo of the students. Fine, you've seen him, now get back to class, or it's detention for all of you. The older students scurried off, but not before Tagata put Midoriya in a friendly headlock and slipped a note into his pocket. Midoriya had no idea what it was about, but he promised himself that he would look at it later. There were no other interruptions on the way to the dorm, but without those distractions, Midoriya was feeling even more nervous. He was worried that his friends would look at him differently. Not only had he been kidnapped, again, he had to remind himself, but he'd come back changed. He wasn't vain by any stretch. At best, he considered himself uninteresting and boring to look at, but he feared that people would think he had been mutilated. What if they think I'm disgusting? What if Achako thinks I'm disgusting? He had to remind himself that while his arm wasn't exactly attractive now, he still had his arm. Uraraka had lost hers, and he was determined not to think less of her for that. 
He had plenty of anxiety, but he thought he knew his friends well enough to know that they wouldn't think less of either him or Uraraka for something so petty. If anything, they've been rather supportive of Uraraka-san, Nezu commented lightly and smiled when Midoriya jumped. You were mumbling about all of that. Not loudly, and only I heard it, but you should really work on that. Why yes, Nezu-sensei. Midoriya stopped outside the dorm and took a deep breath. Why don't you stay outside with me for a little while, Iri-chan? Nezu gently pulled Iri away from the door. I think it's going to get loud, we can go in when things calm down. Iri, still uneasy around loud noises and strangers, nodded and stood behind the principal. When he saw Midoriya hesitate, Aizawa rolled his eyes and opened the door. Just get it over with. Some part of Midoriya was actually hoping that everyone would be waiting for him when he stepped into the dorm. Instead, the lobby was empty, though he heard footsteps around the corner. Hey, is someone there? The familiar voice made Midoriya freeze in his tracks. Aizawa sensei, you just left, it's not rational to. Ashido's teasing died as soon as she stepped into view. Her eyes went wide, and the book bag tumbled from her trembling hands with a loud clatter. She and Midoriya stared at each other for what seemed like an eternity. Then Ashido took a deep breath, and Midoriya prepared for the inevitable. Midori. Ashido launched herself at him, but recent experience had taught Midoriya the value of bracing himself, and he caught his friend in a hug before she could knock him off his feet. Oh my god, you're back. Ashido grabbed him by the ears, turning his head to the sides. Are you okay? How bad were you hurt? What happened to your eyes? They look like mine. We could totally be siblings. She paused to take a breath, then turned her head up and shouted. Hey, everyone. Midori's back. What? There was a crashing sound, followed by what seemed to be a small stampede as class won a storm downstairs to see their wayward vice president. Ida was, not unexpectedly, the first to reach them. He threw all decorum out the window as he grabbed Midoriya in a rib-cracking hug. For once, he didn't have a single lecture to give, and only babbled a mixture of thanks for Midoriya's return, and questions about his health. Siro had actually been behind most of the crowd, but used his tape to swing from the ceiling to get ahead. Unfortunately, his haste caused him to misjudge his landing, and ended up crashing on top of his friends. Nobody seemed to mind, and Midoriya even laughed a little. They had barely gotten to their feet when Yeyurazu and Todoroki both collided with them. The former did nothing to hide her tears as she hugged Midoriya, and even kissed the top of his head like he was her little brother. The latter didn't say anything, but he put his hand on Midoriya's shoulder and didn't let go. The rest of the class pushed in close, their voices melding together into an incomprehensible mess. Almost all of them made sure to have some kind of physical contact with him, as if to make sure that he was really there. Even the more stoic members of the class, like Takoyami and Shoji, briefly patted him on the back. Only Bakugo refrained, staying at the back of the crowd. But when Midoriya made eye contact with him, Bakugo nodded and walked away. For him, that was the same as a tearful welcome. Suddenly, there was a lull, and the crowd backed off. Midoriya was confused, until he felt a pair of arms wrap around him from behind. He looked down and saw that one of those arms was made of metal. Welcome back, Yuraraka said. Her face was buried into his back, so her voice was muffled. But Midoriya heard her clearly. He twisted around so that he could face her, and gently pulled her arms free. He looked at her prosthetic arm, and she looked first at his altered eyes, and then at his arm. Midoriya slowly interlaced the fingers of his left hand with her right. Both of them smiled through their tears. It's good to be back, he said. With those simple words, the dam broke, they held onto each other tightly and sank to their knees, sobbing uncontrollably. They only noticed Iri, who had been watching until now, when she worked up the courage to come inside and hug her guardians in an attempt to make them feel better. They brought her into the embrace, but the crying didn't stop, and Iri eventually realized that the tears weren't those of sadness, but relief. It was only later, when Midoriya had cried himself raw and his emotions had settled, that he realized that one of his friends hadn't been part of the reunion. Asmuth didn't normally need to double-check his findings, especially when it came to a simple maintenance. However, he now paced his lab as he read through the results of his scans for the fifteenth time, and Eunice was left wondering if she should get something to calm him down. Boss, what's got you so worked up? She finally asked. Did you perform the scans on the satellite exactly as I instructed? Eunice crossed her arms. Of course I did. I've done this sort of thing a thousand times. Asmuth tossed her the datapad he'd been reading, which expanded to fit Eunice's human-sized hand. Read section 13b. Eunice read the section in question. Then she read it again, to be sure she wasn't mistaken. Please tell me this is an equipment malfunction on our end. If it was, do you think I'd be this concerned? Asmuth shook his head. I'm certain, Eunice. The DNA samples were taken, not destroyed, not degraded, 
but taken. All of them, all of them, Eunice felt a bead of sweat trickle down her neck. What do we do about it? We can't start a panic, not on Ben's Earth, nor on Midoriya's. For now, we'll insert more scanners over the planet, and hope we can differentiate the pure DNA from the hybridized humans. That's your plan? Eunice asked incredulously. Help? Asmuth sighed. Right now, it's all we have. Midoriya sighed and rubbed his eyes as he sat down on his new bed. It was now late at night, and he had finally recovered from everything earlier in the morning enough to put his things in his room. He still had a few boxes to unpack but they were mostly decorations, a few of his favorite All Might posters and collectibles, along with a few Hawks-themed items. He planned to set those all up tomorrow, when he had the time. There was a knock on his door, which was surprising. Everyone was just as emotionally drained as he was, so he wasn't expecting anyone to come out of their rooms. He opened the door and smiled at Yuraraka. Hey, Deku-kun, she said tiredly. Were you asleep? No, not yet. Midoriya leaned through the doorway and looked down the hall. Um, I don't think the girls are supposed to be on this side of the dorms at night. Yuraraka blushed. W well, I won't tell anyone if you don't. Her expression turned worried. Besides, I need your help. Anything. She briefly smiled at his immediate response. It's Tsu. She hasn't been herself since. Well, since the league took you. Yuraraka gave an abbreviated explanation of what Asui had said at the hospital. Midoriya didn't blame her for trying to stop their friends, even if they had somehow located him. They would have had to contend with all for one, which was certain death. Where is she? He asked. Just outside. Iraraka rubbed her left shoulder with her right hand, and Midoriya noticed that she didn't float, even though she used all five fingers. I tried to talk to her, but she's been avoiding me. Maybe you can get through to her. I'll try. Midoriya's mind briefly flashed back to Koda. But I haven't had good luck with people who don't want to listen. Thanks, Izuku. Yuraraka stole a quick kiss and then turned to leave. See you later. Midoriya smiled. Definitely. Before he left to find his wayward friend, Midoriya went back to his desk, where several framed pictures sat. There were photos of his parents, along with one of the Tennysons, but the one he lingered on had been given by Ben upon Inko's request. For all that the Midoriyas considered Holo Ben a member of the family, he had never had his picture taken. When Ben saw how broken Holo Ben's death had made Inko, he had given her a copy of a picture of himself as a teenager. Even if it wasn't actually Holo Ben, it looked exactly like him. Thanks, Midoriya whispered to the photo. For everything. After quietly closing the door behind him, Midoriya set out to find Asui. She was wandering just outside the dorms, but she remained under the outer lights, which technically meant that she wasn't breaking curfew. Even from a distance, Midoriya could see the shadows under her eyes and the listless way she walked. Clearly, she hadn't been sleeping well, if at all. Hey, Su. Asui jumped a good ten feet into the air at the sound of his voice. When she landed, she whirled to face him. Can we talk? Asui seemed to shrink in on herself and stepped back. I'd rather not. Considering that when Holoben had kept things to himself, it had led to his death, that was not the answer Midoriya was looking for. When Asui tried to back off, he moved forward and grabbed her hand. Please, Tsu. He put his free hand on her shoulder. Talk to me. Asui refused to look him in the eye. I don't deserve to talk tea to you. Midoriya was shocked to see tears running down her cheeks. Of all his friends, Asui was the least likely to break down like that. What makes you say that? Ayasui sniffed and tried to pull back, but Midoriya didn't let go. I'm a terrible person. Everyone wanted to save you, but I stopped them, and then you got hurt, and it's all my fault. Midoriya blinked as he processed the rush of words that poured out, and even Asui seemed surprised at herself. Su Midoriya took a moment to put his feelings into words. What happened to me was nobody's fault. I mean, maybe it was my fault, since I decided to fight villains with no backup, but you had nothing to do with that. But if I hadn't stopped everyone, maybe we could have found you before it was too late. At this point, Asui was sobbing, and it broke Midoriya's heart. He gently pulled her in for a hug, though he kept his grip loose enough that she could escape if she really wanted to. What would you guys have done if you had found me? He asked. Everyone in the league is dangerous, and they have nine with them. That guy is a legend. And there were a bunch of gnomus, and all for one. B but we could have. Some of the top heroes in Japan couldn't rescue me in time, Midoriya interrupted. It took Ben and All Might to take all for one down. If you had been there, you would have died. He took a risk and stepped back so that he could point at his eyes. I'd rather have this happen than lose any of you. I still should have supported them, Asui said stubbornly. You were trying to save them, Midoriya corrected, and put both his hands on her shoulders. Suyo, I am not mad at you. I don't blame you. None of this was your fault. He's right. Both of them turned and saw the other rising stars behind them. Yeyorazu wiped away a few stray tears of her own. 
Sue, I am so sorry if we made you feel like you were a bad friend. Momo is right. Ida did nothing to hide his own emotions as he chopped at the air and nearly hit Todoroki. We were so worried about Achako and Izuku that we neglected your own feelings. If anything, it is us who should be apologizing. Ashido held out her arms. Come on, Sue. It's just not the same without our favorite frog girl. The corner of Asui's mouth quirked up, despite her attempt to stop it. I'm your only frog girl, I'm your favorite by default. Exactly, now let us hug you. Siro, who had been hanging back, stepped in front of them. One thing, first. He walked up to Asui, who looked ready to bolt. Sue I am so sorry for what I said. Can you ever forgive? Oof. The wind was knocked from his lungs as Asui tackled him. Shut up and hold me ribbit. In an echo of that morning, the other rising stars gathered together in a group hug. They had all thought that they had run out of tears by then, but they were mistaken. Unlike before, Asui's tears were of relief and forgiveness, and after a little while, she fell asleep in Siro's arms. As Midoriya led his friends back inside, they all realized something that helped them sleep a little better that night. The villains had done their best to break them, but the rising stars would still shine bright. Miwa TV version The music starts, and Midoriya is seen running down a hallway at UA. The other rising stars are right behind him, and as they run, the rest of Class 1 adjoins them as they burst into their homeroom. The scene changes to a split image, with Midoriya staring at his left arm on one side, and Yuraka doing the same to her right arm. The two turn around, and the images become one. They smile at each other and high-five, only for Midoriya to start floating. In the background, the other rising stars laugh while Yuraka panics. The scene rapidly changes between Inko and her home, smiling sadly at a picture of Holo Ben. Nezu working at his desk while Iri draws in the corner. The big three training while Melissa and Hatsum work on a half-built machine. To All Might, Sir Nighteye and Gran Torino, standing respectfully in front of a grave. The next scene shows Midoriya in his costume, about to leave the locker room. He glances over his shoulder, and his eyes grow wide when he sees Holo Ben, who gives him a thumbs up. Midoriya blinks, and when his eyes open, Holo Ben is gone. He wipes away a tear and pushes open the door. There is a bright flash of light, and then Midoriya is leaping through the air as Raph, followed by the other rising stars as they charge a group of robots. There is another flash of light, and then the rising stars are standing on a pile of destroyed robots. Aizawa is lecturing them, and both Midoriya and Ashido look particularly embarrassed. The scene changes one more time, showing Midoriya standing face to face with Ben, who smiles down at him. Ben holds out his left hand, which Midoriya takes with his own. Their watches glow, and then Ben vanishes, leaving Midoriya to watch the sunrise. The first morning Midoriya woke up in the dorms, he couldn't help but jump at the noise of 19 other teenagers getting ready for the day at about the same time. As someone used to a much quieter home life, it was jarring, to say the least, he wondered if everyone else was as disoriented, until he remembered that they had had a few days to get used to it. Good morning, he said cautiously when he came downstairs after cleaning up. Most of his class was already there, either eating breakfast or making their own. Yuraka smiled widely as she walked alongside him, her right arm gently nudging his left. Hey, Midori Achako. Ashido grinned and waved from her seat at a table. You're just in time. Sato's making pancakes and they're awesome. Sato, wearing a chef's apron over his school uniform, shrugged. They're not hard to make, Ashido. All you have to do is follow the directions on the bag. Ashido made a face. First of all, you're amazing at baking. I don't think pancakes count as baking. Todoroki cut in from next to her. Shush, you. Ashido covered his mouth with one hand. Second of all, I have burned salads. I'm not kidding. Midoriya and Yuraka were both in the process of sitting down when she said that, and froze halfway. More than one student who heard Ashido was now giving her worried looks. How did you? I was five, and I thought all food had to be cooked, unless it was ice cream. Ashido giggled. After that, my parents never let me in the kitchen unless it was to cut up vegetables or something. Sato stared blankly at her, then very deliberately placed himself between her and the kitchen he'd already claimed as his domain. You are never coming in here unsupervised. Todoroki pulled Ishido's hand off his mouth. Can I use my quirk to bake cookies? And you're banned forever. He glanced suspiciously at Midoriya. Don't tell me you're gonna try and cook with heat blast or something. Er, no. Midoriya tried not to look intimidated when being stared down by someone much larger and stronger than he was, and failed. His confidence was not helped by Yuraka laughing hysterically. Actually, I'm not bad at cooking, if you want any help. Sato's expression softened. 
Yeah, sure, I'd appreciate it. Ashido hummed thoughtfully. Ah, so my twin got all the cooking skills. Midoriya started. T twin. Ashido got up and walked over to him and pointed at his hair. We have the exact same kind of messy hair. Her finger dropped to point at his eyes. In our eyes, she put her hands on her hips and nodded decisively. We are twins. You're the responsible one, I'm the fun one. Todoroki nodded at her. You're also the cute one. I, uh, no one missed how Ashido's sputter and blush were also identical to Midoriya's, thus unintentionally supporting her twin theory. Sitting at another table, Siro shook his head. How does Shoto flirt like that and never break a sweat? Kaminari paused, seemed to struggle with himself, then sighed in resignation. It's probably because he's so cool. Gyro groaned and slapped him upside the head. You are an idiot. I can't help myself, it's too obvious not to use. Sui, who looked much better after getting a full night's sleep without guilt-fueled nightmares, ignored the bickering. Panta, Ribbit, where's your tie? Technically, the dress code only says that we have to have it with us. Siro pulled his tie out of his pocket. It only specifies wearing it when we're representing the school off campus. Huh? Sui glanced over her shoulder at Bakugo who was trying to ignore Kirishima's attempts to get him to talk. That explains why none of the teachers ever told him to wear his ribbit. Wait, seriously. Kaminari immediately pulled off his tie. I can breathe again. Gyro rolled her eyes, even as she removed her own tie. That explains why you're an idiot. Your tie was too tight. It was killing your brain cells. News of the dress code loophole quickly spread throughout the class, and by the time they sat down in homeroom, only Yeyurazu and Ida had elected to wear their ties. Welcome back to class, Aizawa said. If he noticed the lack of ties, he didn't care. Since none of you have homework to turn in, we're doing something different today. It has to do with the dorms. There was a slight shift of Hagakura's uniform. Everyone assumed she had tilted her head. Um, did we do something wrong? Aizawa sighed. No, this one is on us, actually. We were so focused on getting the dorms built and you all situated that something slipped by us. He took out a remote and pressed a few buttons. The lights dimmed and a screen slid down from the ceiling. Now, you're all teenagers, and if you're not 16 yet, you will be before the school year is out. We're obliged to show you this video if you're going to be living together. The video began to play. At first, everyone was bemused until the title was shown. It included the word sex ed. When it ended almost an hour later, Midoriya and Yuraka were staring dead-eyed at the screen, their spines practically locked in place to avoid looking at each other. Ashido had a smattering of purple on her face, but she seemed relatively composed. Her boyfriend, on the other hand, had grown so pale that his burn practically glowed. Siro made the mistake of looking at Asui. She had a slight blush, but otherwise looked unfazed as she waggled her eyebrows at him. He immediately began slamming his head against his desk. Yeyorazu had tried to watch the video objectively, but gave up halfway through. She had spent the rest of the time with her hands over her crimson face. Ida looked like he had died sitting up, and someone poked him later to make sure he was still breathing. Most of the rest of the class hardly fared better. No one looked at each other, though Bakugo just huffed and looked like he didn't care, and Shoji was impossible to read through his mask. Near the end, Dark Shadow had emerged from Takoyami, looked around at the class, and simply said you're all sick. The only one to remain completely at ease was Maita. In fact, he'd started taking notes after only a few minutes into the video. Anyway, Aizawa said as the lights came back on, we needed to show you this. I'll be rational and say that sex is probably going to happen at some point. The fact that many of you seem to be ignorant of this stuff makes me want to yell at your previous schools. You all need to know about it so that you can make smart decisions. Remember, your actions have consequences, both as heroes and in your personal lives. Now, go get ready for your next class. It took until the end of the day before things started to get back to normal with the students. They were at least able to hold a conversation on their way to the lockers to get changed into their costumes, but the awkwardness returned when they were faced with classmates that, for most, wore outfits that were skin-tight, revealing, or both. Midoriya tried to focus on one aspect of Yuraraka's costume, instead of how good she looked in it. She had removed the sleeve on her right arm from the bicep down, exposing the prosthetic, though she kept the vambrace. Yuraraka caught him staring, she blushed, but then raised her arm to show it off. I mean, why hide it, right? All right. Midoriya didn't know what else to say, but he hoped his wobbly smile conveyed how he felt. All right, students, Cementos was taking the lead for heroics today, and gestured to the inside of the gym he'd taken them to. It was completely empty, with only a concrete floor. This is Gym Gamma, he continued proudly. It only reaches its full potential when I'm here. My quirk lets me turn the concrete into basically whatever might be needed for your training. 
If there's something else you need, Power Loader has a depot's worth of supplies to add as well. And if that's not enough, I'm sure Yeamomo can make something, Ashido commented, to general laughter. Cementas chuckled. Anyway, I'm sure you're wondering just why you've been brought here today. You see, today you'll be working on what are known as ultimate moves. It had the class attention. Ultimate moves were a hero's signature, usually a super powerful application of their quirk, or a martial arts move that was assisted by said quirk. It was often loud, flashy, and usually what got them noticed. In short, it was exactly what a bunch of teenagers expected to do as heroes. Some of them already had what could be considered ultimate moves, such as Bakugo's Howitzer Impact, or Ida's Recipro Techniques. Other moves, like Ashido's Acid X, had been created in the heat of the moment. If they wanted to use them again, they would need serious refinement. Now, there's also a major exam coming up, Aizawa cut in. This will be for your provisional licenses. Normally, we wouldn't have you take this test until at least your second year, but the government wants all hero classes to at least try. The exam will be in a few weeks, so you'll have enough time to perfect at least one move, polish any techniques that might be lacking, and make modifications to your costumes if you want. Again, the class was more than a little interested. If they could get provisional licenses, they were only a few steps away from being full heroes. It would allow them to use their quirks to fight villains or help civilians in a disaster, though they would be under heavy scrutiny the entire time. Cementus placed his hand on the floor, and twenty platforms rose up. Each of you will work on your ultimate moves over there. For today, just give it some thought, and share any ideas with us, we'll provide feedback and tell you if your plan is viable or not. If you need a living punching bag, Ectoplasm will be present to provide a clone. Ectoplasm, who had been silent until now, glared at his fellow teacher. I prefer sparring partner. I'm sure you do. No one could tell if Cementos' jolly tone was teasing or not. It wasn't until the students spread out that they noticed that one of their number was unusually calm. If anything, Midoriya seemed more certain of himself than ever before. Do you already have a move in mind, Midoriya-san? An ectoplasm clone asked. With your variety, I would have thought that you would have some difficulty. Midoriya smiled. Actually, I don't just have an ultimate move, I've got ultimate forms. More than one student noticed that Midoriya didn't reach for his watch before transforming into Edel. While his classmates didn't see the significance, his teachers did. All of them had known that that was a major weakness of his, and it had been pointed out when they read the police report about his fight with Muscular and Chimera. It seemed that that was no longer an issue. All right, Edel said. Time to go plus ultimate. There was another flash of green light, and when it faded, a few jaws dropped. Ultimate Edel wasn't much taller than before, but his shell was more pronounced, giving him a hunched look. His frontal carapace almost looked like pectoral muscles, with glowing red light around the hinges. He had two more arms growing from his sides, and though they were the same length, his previous set of arms was now markedly longer and thicker, almost reaching the ground. His eyes were now gone, and he had four mandibles. His horn now ended in a set of eight sharp prongs that almost looked like a comb. The Omnitrix dial, now sporting its four spikes, had traveled upwards and sat just below where a human's throat would be. What stood out the most, however, was his new coloring. His exoskeleton was now a gleaming gold, while the softer parts of his body were a bright crimson. Impressive, Ectoplasm commented. I assume that this is your form pushed to its maximum. Yeah, Ultimate Edel said, his voice coming out as a raspy hiss. I can stay like this for about 10 minutes, and it takes about another 20 minutes of charge to use. For Midoriya's own safety, his teachers had been informed about his time limit, but Nezu had withheld knowledge about the Ultimates. He had wanted to surprise the teachers, and it had worked. So, using the full 10 minutes of this form cuts your hour in half, Ectoplasm noted. I hope that its power makes up for such a large energy drain. So do I, Ultimate Edel thought. I picked Edel for one of the ultimate slots, but I'm not sure what he actually does now. Well, Ben said that I would have an instinctive idea of how to use these powers. With a grunt, he brought one of his oversized fists down on his platform, breaking off several large chunks of concrete. He tossed them further away, and then took a step back, his smaller arms reached up and grabbed his pectoral plates, and with a slight heave, he pulled them open. Instead of red flesh underneath the carapace, there was an empty void. There was a howling noise as the hole in his chest acted like a giant vacuum, sucking up the chunks of cement. Once the debris was gone, the carapace sealed back up, and Ultimate Edel tilted his head towards a stunned ectoplasm clone. It won't hurt the real you if I destroy the clone, right? More like a memory of pain, said clone corrected. The real me trained to not be distracted by pain a long time ago. Okay, Ultimate Edel didn't even bother to fully turn, 
The prongs on his horn glowed and fired red beams of energy straight up. After a moment, all eight beams made sharp turns in different directions, then kept angling until they reached the clone, which exploded upon impact. Impressive, another clone said as he climbed up the platform. Most impressive, do you need to see your target to lock on, and can you hit multiple targets at once? Not directly, and yes, Ultimate Eagle replied. I'm emitting an electromagnetic coating that I can feel to everything around me, so it's more like I'm guiding the shots through touch. Any weaknesses? Ectoplasm asked. If you know them, it will be easier to cover them. I'm a lot slower, Ultimate Eagle admitted. But my armor is pretty durable, and I don't need to eat things to fire my beams. Eating just makes it stronger. Midoriya was honestly a little unnerved that he knew these things, but he wasn't aware of specific numbers or his maximum range. Those things would have to be learned through practice, and he had nine more to go through. So, you're like a walking fortress. Ectoplasm nodded to himself. All right, use up the rest of your ten minutes, and then take a break to recharge. Use today to get used to this one, and then practice with any others until the exam. If you have any problems with that black hole ability, speak to Thirteen. She has more experience with that sort of thing. Ultimate Eagle cracked his knuckles. Yes, sir. After getting over how impressed they were with Midoriya's new trick, they might have known about the Ultimates, but it was another thing entirely to see them in action. The other rising stars threw themselves into their own training. Ciro had already come up with a move, but his quirk had only now become strong enough for him to put it into practice. Instead of one thick strand of tape, he could now fire three smaller strands from each elbow. They weren't that much weaker than the single strands, and could cover a wide area if he used both elbows. The only downside was that it dehydrated him almost twice as fast, but the benefits far outweighed the costs. Ida was attempting to use his boosters in one-second bursts, allowing him to make impossibly sharp turns to outmaneuver his enemies. He already had his Recipro burst, so he had to come up with a new name. Eventually, he settled on Recipro Pulse. Ashido had two moves in mind. The first was a concentrated stream of acid, which she managed by forming a funnel with her hands and using the pressure to extend her range and accuracy. The second was a defensive option. She wanted to coat her entire body in acid, almost like armor, but it was hard to maintain with her current level of control. Instead, she created a stopgap technique by making a thin veil of acid all around her. It only lasted for a moment, but if she could time it right, she could block almost anything that wasn't too big or moving too fast. Yeyorazu didn't have an ultimate move in mind. Instead, she worked on creating items of her own invention, rather than copying existing things. Her current project was a shaped mine that could drill several inches underground. The explosives weren't made to be especially strong, but they could send someone staggering, and stepping directly on one could easily result in a broken ankle. Her goal was to build up her lipid efficiency so that she could create a small minefield without exhausting herself. At the moment, she could manage 20 before going for one of the high-calorie snacks in her belt. Todoroki didn't have a name for his move, but it was brutal in its simplicity. He would trap a target in an open-ended cone of ice and then fill it with the hottest fire he could manage. The sudden change in temperature would cause an explosion. After seeing the Namu from the USJ attack and knowing about villains like All for One and Nine, he decided that a move that could deal as much damage as possible in an instant was in order. It wasn't ready for use, but Ectoplasm assured him that a small-scale experiment would be viable soon. Sui had apparently already been working on two techniques. Neither relied so much on hard work as it did study. After all, her quirk allowed her to do anything a frog could do, so as long as she understood how that particular frog did it, so could she. Her first move revolved around changing the pigment of her body to blend in with her surroundings, while the second involved secreting poison through her sweat glands. The latter's problem was that she couldn't quite get the poison to a level that wasn't lethal, and the former's was that she could only make her body camouflaged, not her costume. Like Yeyorazu, Yuraraka wasn't creating any new moves, instead, she was improving her aerial mobility by using her quirk on herself. Without the nausea slowing her down, she could easily perform flips and spins through the air, though directed travel was a problem. However, with her control now so much better, she was confident that she could use the support items she'd requested from Power Loader and Hatsu. Some students were more introspective during the first day of training, while others attacked the work. By the end of the day, everyone felt that they had made progress, or at least knew what they wanted to do. 
that's enough of that, Aizawa said, several hours later. Get cleaned up and turn your costumes in. Speaking of which, you have until the end of the week to submit any changes you want to the support department, but wait until after tomorrow's practice, in case you have any last-minute ideas. As Midoriya used the locker room showers, he wondered if he should make any changes to his costume. There wasn't much, if anything, a change would do for him in the field. Still, as he thought about his current look, he realized that it was a little childish. Maybe he could go for something a little sleeker, and not something that he could have made from things in his closet. Hey, Izuku, Todoroki said as they put their school uniforms back on. Can I ask a question? Midoriya nodded. Sure. Is it about our ultimate moves? No, it's not school related. Todoroki hesitated for a moment. I wanted to see if Mina wanted to go on a date. Then I realized that I don't actually know how to go on a date. Maito, who was nearby and had overheard, scowled. You're gonna ask the most nervous guy on the planet about romance. Hello, ladies experts right here. I'm not even going to dignify that with a response, Todoroki said, and Minda stormed off in a huff. Anyway, Izuku. Uh, all right. Midoriya shrugged helplessly. Well, Achako and I wanted to start with something simple, dinner and a walk on the beach. We can't really do those things, Todoroki pointed out. Why yeah, but Sato and I could cook something special for you. Midoriya shrugged again. And I think we could trust our class to give you two some space. Todoroki thought about it. That could work. Thanks. No problem. Midoriya paused. How come you're asking me about this? You're the only person I know who's been on a date. Todoroki's smirk was so small that Midoriya barely caught it. Also, since you two are twins now, I thought this could be a way of asking for your blessing. Hey. In the girls' locker room, Yuraraka's thoughts were elsewhere as she showered. She had done exceptionally well with her quirk today, and if the equipment Hatsum was working on performed as intended, well, everyone would be in for quite the surprise. Achako, Yuraka was pulled to the here and now by Asui's voice. Are you okay, Ribbit? Um, yes. Now clean. She turned off the water and wrapped a towel around herself. Why? Sorry, I was just wondering about your arm. Now that she had been forgiven, even if Yuraka thought she didn't need forgiveness, Asui was back to being her blunt self. Do you have any problems cleaning it? After ensuring the towel was secure, Yuraka pulled open the shower curtain. The other girls were in the process of getting dressed, or at least were already out of the shower. She had been too distracted to hurry up. Actually, no. She held her arm out and marveled at the water droplets that slid from the metal. It's totally waterproof and has something that cleans the inside. I just have to be a little extra thorough where it attaches to my body. Ribbit. Asui tilted her head and then poked the prosthetic. Did you feel that? Kind of. I can feel pressure and temperature, but it's not the same as when you touch skin. She held her right hand up and slowly curled her fingers. There was a series of clicks as her fingertips connected with her palm. The fingers are a lot more sensitive, though. I can feel all kinds of textures. I imagine it would have to be. Yayorazu commented as she dried her hair. It would be much harder to do anything if you couldn't really feel what you were touching. Plus, I'm right-handed, so that's kind of important. Yuraka paused. You know, I was expecting Mina to make some comment about touching by now. What? Ashido was frozen by her locker, half-dressed and staring at her phone. Sorry, I heard my name. Hagakure, the only one who could shower and walk around without a towel, gave a low whistle as she stood naked behind Ashido to look at her phone. Todoroki just asked her out. Gyro scoffed. Over a text. Not cool. He, uh, asked if I was okay with dinner tonight, Ashido said. Should I say yes? Why are you even asking? Yuraka rolled her eyes as she put on her clothes. You're the one who's always flirting with him, and he flirts back. Yeah, but most of the time I'm just messing around. Ashido shuffled in place. I know we're official, but this is kinda sudden, I was gonna make a move at the summer camp. Yuraka noticed how the other girls were very pointedly not looking at her, and she sighed. If they were going to move on from that, it looked like she was going to have to take the first step. Now we know those villains are unforgivably evil, she joked. They ruined the moment. The laughter that followed was weak, but it was genuine. Deku, Midoriya tried not to jump when Bekugo approached him. After everything with the League of Villains, though, it was easier than before. Yes, Midoriya mentally patted himself on the back for not stuttering. Bakugo sat down across from him, ignoring the glares from Ashido and Siro, who were also at the table. Two things, and then I'm outta here. First, when the fuck could your transformations go fucking plus ultra like that? I call it plus ultimate, Midoriya said mildly, and then shrugged. And, oh, I did it first at I Island. Why? Bakugo's eyes narrowed in thought. How the fuck did you get so strong? Is that your second question? Ashido teased, though there was a slight edge to her tone. 
Bakugo ignored her. Answer the goddamn question, nerd. Midoriya shrugged. Karma, after everything you and the rest of the world put me through. Fine, whatever. Bakugo scowled and got up. If you won't tell me how you got so damn strong, I'll figure it out myself, and then I'll show this entire fucking school who the next top hero is gonna be. Siro waited until Bakugo had stormed off before speaking. What's his problem? He hates losing, Midoriya explained. Even if it's only in his head. Well, he is losing to you, Ashido pointed out. You beat him in the battle trial and the sports festival, and you've taken down stronger villains than he has. At least he's better than he was, Midoriya said. He only insulted me once and didn't shout die. So, on a scale of 1 to 10, he went from a negative 4 to, what, a 0. Ashido rolled her eyes. Whatever, can we finish this homework now? I want to be done before my date with Shoto. Speaking of dates, Siro eyed Midoriya speculatively. You and Achako should go out again. At least do what Mina and Shoto are doing, the rest of us could watch Eri for you. Midoriya blushed, then glanced back to where Yuraraka was sitting on a couch. She was working on another assignment with Yeyurazu, while also keeping an eye on Eri, who was enjoying filling in a coloring book. Yuraraka noticed him staring and smiled. His blush grew as he waved. Um, maybe that's a good idea, he admitted. Ashido grinned. Hey, Midori, all we have to do is get Hanta and Sue together, and then we'll only have Momo and Tenya to go. Midoriya frowned at that. Hey, where is Tenya? I haven't seen him since we got back from class. Probably memorizing all the rules for the dorms, Ashido said dismissively. Now come on, I have homework to get through. Contrary to his friend's belief, Ida was not memorizing every rule he could find. He had finished his homework, and was now in one of the gyms, sparring with Kirishima. Remind me again, oof. Kirishima staggered from a powerful kick, but remained on his feet. Remind me again why you wanted to do this now, dude. Ida slipped under A, to him, slow counter and delivered a 1-2 blow to Kirishima's stomach. You saw what happened to Yamomo during the villain's attack, yes. Kirishima grimaced. Yeah, that that's gonna stick with me for a while. That happened because I wasn't fast enough. Ida grunted when Kirishima clipped his shoulder. Dude, you can't blame. I am aware that it wasn't my fault, Ida interrupted. I do not feel guilty because of a perceived failing. I am upset that it happened at all, and I am angry at the villains who hurt my friends. I want to be better, so that I might prevent it from happening again, if I can. Yeah, I get it. Kirishima saw the heavy blow coming, and had to harden his torso to keep from getting a cracked rib. I'm supposed to be the one who takes the hits, and all I could do was stand there, useless. Just like last time, Ida was curious about what he meant by that, but Kirishima's expression suggested that he didn't want to talk about it. Then perhaps we can both work to make sure that we do better next time. Kirishima's sharp-toothed grin was in full force. Yeah, come on, hit me with your best shot. The next day, Midoriya was using heroics to practice with ultimate water hazard. He had initially been hesitant to keep that one, since it reminded him of losing Holoben. However, he eventually came to the conclusion that using ultimate water hazard was a good tribute to the last time Holoben helped him in a battle. Heads up, he shouted as he flew over Gyro, who ducked. Sorry, watch it. Gyro shook water out of her hair and glared up at him. Can you practice somewhere else? Ultimate water hazard cut his water pressure and landed on a nearby platform. Like where? It's hard to practice flying when everyone is going to get soaked no matter where I go. Gyro rolled her eyes. How about over Kaminari? At least watching him short out will be funny. Hey, Kaminari shook his fist at her. Why do you enjoy my pain so much? I'm easily amused by stupid people. Gyro shot back. Midoriya turned back to normal and tried to tune out the bickering. Instead, he noticed something that, because he'd been so focused on his training, he'd missed before. Rather than ask Gyro or Kaminari and get in the middle of their squabbling, he walked over to Yeyurazu, who was taking a break. Hey, Momo, where did Achako go? Come, Yeyurazu frowned and looked around. That's strange. She left only a few minutes after training started. She should have been back by now. Why did she leave? The support course had something for her. Yeyurazu brought up her arm-mounted tablet and started scrolling through various items she had highlighted. I'm sure she'll be back before class is over. I am. Sure enough, Yuraraka jogged into Jim Gamma with a new addition to her costume. It looked like a pink diamond-shaped backpack on her back, connected to her shoulders and her belt. What do you think? Midoriya scratched his head. Um, does it do anything? Just watch. Yuraraka tapped the side of her helmet, and the faceplate was tinted black. What they couldn't see was that she was focusing on several icons that appeared on the inside of her helmet. A moment later, two slots opened up on her backpack, and a pair of segmented wings unfolded. 
Each feather was painted pink, save for the lower few inches, which were black. Midoriya's jaw dropped. Well, you can fly now. Uraraka pretended to examine her nails nonchalantly. Well, I could always float, but now I can really steer. Check this out. She placed one hand on her shoulder, applying her quirk. A moment after lifting off the ground, slim thrusters on the ends of each feather activated, and she started to truly fly. It was obvious that she wasn't quite used to it yet. More than once, she wobbled uncertainly. But there were a few moments where she flew gracefully. Maybe Midoriya was being biased, but in those moments, he thought she looked like an angel. When Uraraka landed, her wings folded back inside the backpack. Her visor became transparent once again, and they could see her smile. So, what did you think? Midoriya couldn't keep the grin off his face. That was so cool. Uraraka blushed and rubbed the back of her helmet. Th thanks, Deku-kun. Yeyurazu circled her, one finger tapping her chin in thought. So, the wings are propelling you so easily because you became weightless, yes. Uh huh. Yuraraka deployed her wings again and slowly turned around, though Midoriya and Yeyurazu had to step back to avoid getting hit. It's really just about steering and adjusting my speed, but since I'm not fighting gravity, I can go really fast. I think my training is going to focus on mastering my flight for a while. Indeed it is. Aizawa's voice made them jump. If you have time to show off, you have time to train. Get to it, all three of you. Yes, Aizawa sensei. All three snapped and darted off. Quite impressive, huh? Aizawa glanced over his shoulder at All Might. Now that his secret was out, he was in his skinny form and looked a great deal more relaxed. Some of these kids have such advanced support items. Some of their quirks require it, Aizawa said. They can't maximize their abilities without outside help, though they shouldn't rely on it. Unless it's young Midoriya, All Might half-joked. Those ultimate forms of his are quite formidable. Aizawa grunted. Are you three still spying on him when he trains on Saturdays? He frowned. Does he even know you're there? All Might's guilty shuffling was all the confirmation Aizawa needed. I was mostly there to see if young Tagata needed anything. Yes, with that mysterious increase in power he had at the beginning of the year, Aizawa couldn't lie to himself and say that he didn't enjoy watching All Might squirm a little. The man was notoriously bad at keeping secrets if you knew what to look for. Hey, oh, I'm still not allowed to do anything strenuous, but I think I can give some of the students some advice. Bye. All Might walked off before Aizawa could do more than scowl. Hey, Kirishima-san, let this old man give you some pointers, eh? Hey. Aizawa let the older man get on with his antics, but something still bothered him. All Might had never denied spying on Midoriya, and he'd gleaned that All Might had some connection to All for One. He wondered if the cause of the spying came from a connection between Midoriya and All for One, perceived or otherwise. Just remember that he's my student before he's yours, Aizawa thought. If you delude yourself into thinking he's a threat, I know where I'll stand. The days passed, and Class 1 began to get used to their new lifestyles. However, living together meant that even the less observant among the students started to learn things about each other. For instance, Takoyami had to sleep with a nightlight. That little bit of light prevented dark shadow who didn't need sleep, from going berserk. The idea that their classmates' other half might actually do that made a few of them nervous, until they remembered that a good number of them could generate light in one way or another. Gyro and Shoji were the best at observing others, so they were the first to really grasp just how close some of their classmates were. Specifically, the bond between Midoriya's group of friends, a group that many in the class had unofficially dubbed the Deka Squad. It wasn't like they excluded contact with everyone else, save for Bakugo. Midoriya, for instance, might have been shy and unlikely to start a conversation, but he could get quite animated about almost anything, especially if he got going about quirks and heroes. He also didn't judge people by their appearances, if anything. He seemed to gravitate towards those whose quirks made them different, like Takoyami and Shoji. Aside from Bakugo, the only person in the class the girls of the Deka Squad actively avoided was Maita. Yeyurazu enjoyed spending time with Jiro, Yuraraka and Ashido got along with just about everyone, and Asui was often seen hanging out with Kaminari and Koda. For all his quiet loner attitude, Todoroki found that he could get along with Takoyami and Shoji, and often joined them in a group meditation. Ida had formed a rapport with Kirishima, and the former often helped the latter with homework. If Bakugo wasn't involved, Siro enjoyed spending time with Kaminari and, surprisingly, Mainta, though he wasn't above taping his mouth shut if he started drooling over girls. But, as the rest of Class 1 soon realized, there was something special when those eight were together. They had all seen glimpses of it before, but now it was obvious, their eyes lit up just a little more, and their smiles were just a little wider. 
The biggest clue, one that woke up even the oblivious Kirishima, was when the eight of them piled into Yeyorazu's room to watch movies. Apparently, they had started the tradition at Yeyorazu's home shortly after school had started. But since that location was no longer viable, she had created a screen to project movies onto. They didn't necessarily bar anyone from joining them, not that there was much room left, but everyone else got the feeling that they would have been intruding on something. Movies weren't the only thing they did together when Aizawa showed up at the dorms one evening and noticed their absence. He found them in a rough circle in Yeyorazu's room, doing homework. The girls were on the massive and ornate bed, and the boys were on the floor, but they were so relaxed that Aizawa, who had gone unnoticed, didn't see young adults still recovering from a traumatic event, but happy teenagers spending time together. After a week of living together, they were less careful about only being so relaxed in private. One evening, the whole class was watching an old documentary in the living room. Technically, it was part of the history section of Heroics, but they had only watched part of it in class. Midoriya, who had seen it already, had insisted that they watch the whole thing, because it focused on lesser-known heroes who would eventually form the first registered hero team. During the film, no one missed how close the Deca squad was as they sat on or around one of the sofas. All of them were physically touching at least two others. Yuraka sat next to Midoriya on a blanket on the floor, her head on his shoulder, while her right hand held his left. On Midoriya's other side, Asui's knee bumped his while she leaned against Siro. Behind him, Ashido rested one elbow on his shoulder while she lay sprawled out on the couch. She sat on Todoroki's lap while her legs rested over Yeyurazu's and Ida's. The latter two gently leaned against each other, while Ida and Todoroki occasionally tapped their legs against Midoriya and Yuraraka, respectively, as if to make sure they were still there. Everyone else made sure not to comment, even looking at them felt like they were intruding on a family matter. Later, they all realized that that's what it was, those eight were close because, somehow or another, they had started seeing each other as family. It wasn't until two weeks after moving into the dorms that Midoriya was able to check in with the extended part of his family. The big three were waiting for him at their usual training spot, along with Melissa. Siro and Yeyorazu had come with him, since Tagata had specifically asked for their presence. Even if everyone else had been invited, they were either working on homework or, in the case of Yuraraka and Asui, spending time with Iri. Hey, guys. Tagata was even more energetic than usual. He was practically jumping in place. Glad you could join us. Sorry I couldn't talk to you sooner. Midoriya held up the note he'd been given. You made it seem like it wasn't urgent. I don't think it is. Tagata shrugged. It's just weird. Considering everything we know regarding the truth about quirks, I think the word weird has new meaning. Yeyorazu commented. There was a brief pause when she glanced at Melissa. The other girl had become so close with the big three and the rising stars that they had let her in on the secret. Since Melissa was quirkless, she hadn't felt the brief feeling of violation the others had, but she felt so honored by their trust that she'd broken down in tears. Regardless, having her in the circle of trust was still new. So, what's weird? Midoriya asked. This, Chigata took a few steps back, and the golden glow they were all familiar with surrounded him. After a few seconds, black tendrils burst from his arm and writhed around. When they touched the ground, they latched on and stuck fast. A few moments later, Tagata cut his quirk, and the tendrils dissolved. The only sign that they'd been there were a few cracks in the floor, and fading red marks on his arm. Amajiki, who had seen this several times already, shrugged. This first happened when we tried to rescue you, Izuku. It's so weird, right? Hato floated over to Tagata and poked his arm. It's like those tentacle things have a mind of their own. It's kinda creepy. Amajiki drooped. I have tentacles. Yeah, but... Hato floated back to him and kissed his cheek. You're cute. While Amajiki devolved into a sputtering mess, Midoriya took out his notebook and began jotting things down. How do you trigger it? Do you have any control at all? How strong are those things? Tagata shook his head, his grin never leaving his face. Should have known you'd be excited about this. It seems to happen whenever I really want to catch something. But if there's nothing there, they just sort of flail around. And I can't break them free from something until I completely turn off my quirk. While that is interesting, Yeyorazu cut in, how did this happen? You explained how you developed your strength and speed, but this this doesn't make any sense. Yeah, Tagata scratched the back of his head, expression completely serious. I promised to tell everyone else later, but I've been keeping a secret. He held up one fist. Not all of my quirk is mine, the rest was given to me. As soon as those words left his mouth, Midoriya went pale. Memories of what all for one said to him nearly overwhelmed him. One for all. 
he whispered. To got us started. How did you know? All for one talked about it. Midoriya stared at him. And it makes sense that you would know about him. All Might told you, didn't he? He gave you his quirk. The weight of that revelation had Siro and Yeyurazu sitting down to process it. They weren't necessarily overwhelmed by the idea of a quirk being given to someone else. After all, finding out the truth about quirks had affected them far worse. Instead, it was the idea that All Might, the greatest hero on their earth, had given his power to Togata. Wait a second. Yeyurazu's eyes flitted back and forth, as if she was reading something. It was so similar to how Midoriya would sometimes act that it was almost funny. That's the real reason why All Might retired. If he literally gave away his quirk, then it stands to reason that his own power would diminish. Whoa. Siro glanced up at Midoriya. And I thought you were the only one with world-shattering secrets. Kagata then gave them an abbreviated history of One for All. How it had started with the younger brother of All for One. And had been passed down through the generations, growing stronger with each new bearer. Until it was given to All Might. Finally, the quirk had become strong enough to defeat All for One or at least stop him from becoming even more powerful. However, All Might had been so grievously injured during that battle that he couldn't maintain his power and had sought out a successor, Togata. I already knew part of this, Midoriya admitted suddenly. When I first met All Might, he accidentally transformed in front of me, and he showed me his injury. I had no idea about his quirk until All for One talked about it. Wait, you met All Might before coming to UA? Siro asked. Yeah, almost a year before, Midoriya held up the wrist that bore the Omnitrix. Only a couple hours before finding the Ultimatrix, Hado reached over and patted his head. I guess you had quite the day, huh? The sheer innocence with which she said that cut the tension, and everyone laughed. Hey, maybe we should get back on topic, Melissa suggested. Mirio, you wanted them to be here to help you, remember? Right? Thanks. Tagata's beaming smile made Melissa blush, and she looked away. Anyway, I talked to All Might about this new quirk, it's called Black Whip, and it belonged to one of the previous holders of One for All. None of the previous user's quirks have manifested in a successor, so we're kinda in uncharted territory here. Does that mean you'll have all the previous user's quirks? Midoriya asked. No clue, Tagata admitted. I mean, the first user's quirk is One for All, and All Might was quirkless, so I might get as many as four more. The reason I wanted you three specifically is because Momo knows all about generating stuff, Izuku's quirk know-how is gonna be really helpful, and I think Hanta could really help me figure out Black Whip. Midoriya had stopped listening before then. His mind had come to a screeching halt when he heard that All Might was quirkless. He told me I couldn't become a hero because I didn't have a quirk. He said it was impossible, but he didn't have a quirk. It was given to him, which meant that he wanted to be hero before then. The hypocrisy of someone he idolized was almost overwhelming, and he was so lost in his own thoughts that he jumped when Yeyurazu touched his shoulder. Izuku, are you alright? Huh? Why yeah, I'm okay, Momo. He most certainly was not, but he wanted some time to really think about this before confiding in anyone. Um, sorry, what did Mirio need? He wants our help to figure out how to use multiple quirks. She smiled at him. I think you have a unique insight on that. I g guess so. Midoriya tried to force a smile. It was clearly fake, but Yeyurazu was kind enough not to press the issue. So, where does he want to start? Later that night, Midoriya was in his room, still trying to wrap his head around everything. Thinking about All Might's secret got him focusing on All for One, which led to him dwelling on everything he'd suffered during his stay with the League of Villains. He wanted to talk to someone, but everyone else was asleep and curfew was in effect. Hang on, he said to himself, maybe there is someone I can talk to. He grabbed his phone and scrolled down his list of contacts. He hesitated for a moment, and then called the number. The phone rang only twice before it was picked up. Hey, kid, Ben said cheerfully. What's up? You're not in trouble again, are you? And no, I was just thinking about some things, and I needed to talk. Is that okay? Midoriya frowned when he heard something in the background. Is someone singing? Ben sighed. Yeah, we had a run-in with a guy called the Music Meister. His powers are wacky, we got him, but Ken got whammed. He can't stop singing until the effect wears off. He sighed again. I just wish he'd stop singing the opening to DuckTales. Um, it's fine, he'll be back to normal in a day or two. Anyway, what's on your mind? Well I'm just wondering if I'm doing enough to be a hero. Midoriya could almost see Ben's expression morph into something more serious. Where's this coming from? Ben, I mean, the other Ben, told me about some of the things you did at my age. All I've done is fight a few bad guys, and the last time I did that, I got kidnapped. Midoriya had wanted to talk about his sudden disillusionment with All Might, but now that he started talking about the insecurities he'd thought were buried, he couldn't stop. You saved an entire universe when you were just a kid. 
I just, I feel like I'm not living up to your legacy. Ben was quiet for a long moment. Izuku, I don't care if you haven't done what I've done. If I ever made you think you had to live up to me, I'm sorry. All I wanted was for someone to use the watch to save the day. Just remember that you saved lives. Saving one person is just as important as saving the entire universe, because there's every chance that that person you save is someone else's entire universe. Be but, kid, you just need to be the hero you want to be. If you do that, I'll be proud. Midoriya nodded, even though Ben couldn't see him. Okay, I'll try. As a certain green alien once said, do or do not, there is no try. Ben chuckled for a moment. Are you okay now? Do you need anything else? I think I'm alright. Thanks for that. Midoriya paused when the singing in the background changed. Ken is going to be okay, right? Yeah, Music Meister is annoying, but not super dangerous. Ken, if you're going to sing, could you at least sing something that isn't from the Disney afternoon? Oh, is that what that new song is from? Midoriya asked. Poor Chip and Dale. God, I feel old. Then sighed. All right, I gotta go, kid, I need to smother my son with a pillow. Considering that that wouldn't actually cause Ken harm, Midoriya didn't comment. Bye, Ben, and thanks for the talk. And a time, kid. Midoriya hung up and lay down in his bed. He stared up at the ceiling for what felt like an eternity, and then held up his left arm to look at the Omnitrix. Be the hero I want to be he sat up and went to his desk and fished out a fresh notebook. He had work to do. First it was Achako, now it's Midori. Ashido sighed. It's not like him to be late for heroics. Ada merely shrugged. Perhaps he's getting a new costume. He isn't that late yet. Has he been late for anything, like, ever? Ashido glanced at the clock and saw that, yes, class had only started five minutes ago. She was about to call out to Yuraraka to see if she knew where Midoriya was, but was distracted by an explosion, followed by mad laughter. Oh, great. Up on his platform, which was the tallest, something he had insisted upon so annoyingly that Cementos had caved in. Bakugo held up one fist triumphantly. Ha, huh, I did it. He had been working non-stop to perfect several ultimate moves. There was his AP shot, which concentrated his blast into more of a beam that could punch clean through a solid foot of concrete, and his auto cannon, which fired dozens of small explosions in seconds. However, his best move so far was his AP auto cannon. The combination of both moves, it was impossible to use without building up a lot of sweat first. But if a fight lasted that long, then his opponent probably needed to be put down with that kind of force. His first test of the move had annihilated the ectoplasm clone, along with a good chunk of his platform. He was so distracted by his success that he didn't notice the fist-sized chunks of cement start to fall towards the platform under his, and Asui, who had gotten used to ignoring Bakugo's explosions, didn't see them heading right for her. A few of her classmates saw the tragedy about to unfold, but they had barely started to shout a warning when a blur tore through the gym's entrance to interpose itself between Asui and the debris. Jetre turned into Ai Guy, vaporized most of the concrete, then turned into Water Hazard to blast back the rest. All of those transformations occurred before the green light had faded from the alien before. Thanks, Izuku, Asui croaked. Water Hazard, who had been 15 feet in the air, turned into Ghost Freak and gently glided back down to Asui's platform. No problem. Asui closed her eyes to block out the green light as Midoriya turned back to normal. When she opened them again, she got a good look at his new costume. His pants remained the same, but his boots now had red armor plates that went to his shins, and his hoodie had thick black stripes going up the sleeves, and one up the middle. The ears on his hood were gone, though a black outline of them remained stitched onto the hood. He also had white fingerless gloves, with the Omnitrix dial decorating the back of each. His visor from Hawks was the same, though it gave his eyes a more eerie appearance. He might have kept the same basic style as before, but he looked sleeker and more professional. Are you okay, Sue? He asked. I'm fine, Ribbit. Asui tilted her head. I like the new look. So do I. Maybe I should add some black to my costume. She put one finger to her chin. It seems like almost everyone else has some in their look. Midoriya raised an eyebrow. Maybe some lines on your arms and legs, or some spots on your back. Asui smiled. The spots are more frog-like. I'll go with that one. If you two are done talking fashion, Aizawa called out, maybe you should get back to work. The exam is in one week. Sorry, Aizawa-sensei. Midoriya turned to Asui. Good luck with your training, Su. Same to you, Izuku, Ribbit. Asui appeared unconcerned, but Midoriya knew her well enough to tell that she was nervous. If this test is half as hard as I've heard, we're gonna need it. So alright folks that's all for today. Stay tuned for part 11. Do subscribe, like and share for more such videos. Also check out the story and author The Incredible Muffin on fanfiction.net. 
press the bell icon to be notified first on release. See you in the next video till then goodbye.